This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Are these stocks under-owned by institutional Wall Street? A lot of these companies talking about generative AI. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Investors just worried about the ongoing sales slump in China. And Michael Barr with news. A ship traveling through the Southern Red Sea has been attacked. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Paul Sweeney tanned and rested except for a four-minute space <laughs> exactly. yesterday. How'd the eclipse look? Uh, uh, the uh, eclipse looked great down at the Jersey Shore. The uh, glasses worked perfectly well. Yeah. Uh, we had a whole bunch of people out there uh, t- taking a look at it, so it was a lot of fun. My actually, great though. celebration was on Fifth Avenue to see all the staff of si- Mount Sinai uh, Hospital perfect. come out yep. on the sidewalk, the people that fought COVID, and yes. they were just having a wonderful time uh, looking at the partial eclipse in New York. We're going to be eclipsed by CP tomorrow that's really what we're going towards is the inflation and the inflation pain we're going to address here in a moment with one of america's leading scholars on society and policy betsy stevenson always with michigan will be uh with us but i'm sorry the cpi report is it bigger than last week's jobs report yeah exactly tom i mean people are trying to get a sense of where this federal reserve is going to go we hear we hear from you know fed officials that they're still thinking about uh, a more dovish pivot here, although the market's now starting to back off on it, Tom. We're going to get to it. It's an important conversation with Bessie. I just want to state here that for all of you on Apple CarPlay, on Bloomberg Radio uh, Worldwide, we celebrate today an opening day on April 9, a rational day, none of this March 29th malarkey. And this would be (laughs) Red Sox opening day, Orioles Red Sox. Wow. Thank you, MLB, for giving me a countdown clock, seven hours, seven minutes, 58 seconds. Except the Orioles are really good this year. It's going to be, a, exactly. it's going to be a, a, a tough game. We're in the Interactive Broker Studio. And with that, our Bloomberg Business Flash, a Yankees fan. <laughs> oh, and what a game last night. Good morning. We'll start with futures. They are a little change after the major averages. Closed mix in Monday trading with the NASDAQ leading those gains. The yield on the two-year at 4.77%. That's down about two basis points. A 10-year yield at 4.39%, and that's down about two basis points. Some economic news. We had U.S. small business optimism. It dropped to more than 11-year low in March. Sales expectations slumped. Inflationary pressures, that also remained a trouble spot. Tomorrow, yes, it's CPI. The release of minutes also from the Fed's last policy meeting, and that could include some clues as to where interest rates are headed. Speaking of which, the Fed's Neil Kashkari said he sees the potential for no cuts at all this year. And then you have former Federal Reserve policymaker James Bullard. He said his base case is three interest rate cuts this year. Few companies making news. Tesla, they're down about half a percent right now. The company reached a settlement over a crash blamed on its autopilot. Now, terms were not disclosed about that. General Motors, they're up about half a percent. It's word that its cruise division, it plans to resume testing of its robo-taxis. Now, sources are saying the vehicles will hit the streets with safety drivers in Phoenix, possibly today. And more cash concerns for Boeing. They're down half a percent. Data from Aero Analysis Partners, it shows it likely didn't deliver any 777 freighters during the first quarter. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Greatly appreciate it. It's a quiet economic day, which really gives us time to step back or to go up to 60,000 feet which is the purview of Betsy Stevenson out of uh, Wellesley College, the land of Carl Case long ago, rigid economics to Harvard and then to really holding court and building a huge public policy franchise at the University of Michigan. We're honored to bring you Professor Stevenson to start things this morning. Uh, Betsy, Gerald Ford had an inflation scare and he put out buttons that said whip inflation now. (laughs) That really didn't work. Uh, Betsy Stevenson, what should be the policy prescription for our next president of the United States to whip inflation now? Well, you know, I I think we've actually done a a pretty good job uh, whipping inflation now. Um, You know, it's interesting you ask, like, sort of what should the president do? Um, You know, most people think that it's really the purview of the Federal Reserve to uh, handle inflation. And they do that by trying to make sure that demand is in line with supply. And what we saw in the United States and and frankly around the globe was demand got ahead of supply. Um, And we've seen that normalization start to happen. 
in a way that you know we did see rates rise all over the globe, but we've also right. seen inflation come down, um, and it's come down much with a lot less pain than than people anticipated. And I think that that was because right. supply expanded. We didn't just need to bring down demand, but we got to expand supply. So uh, I give you that whole long answer because I think it does bring us back to what can presidents do? Well, presidents can make sure that we have an environment that allows new businesses to thrive, that allows uh, you know new businesses to form, to expand, that allows hiring to continue in a way that is right. bringing additional people <clears throat> into the labor market. Betsy, what I, I think, think that's one of the things yeah. that people get confused about. They see a hot labor right. market and they say, oh, maybe that's bad for inflation. Right. The so mail only bad for inflation if we can't find the people to hire. Betsy, the mail that Paul Sweeney and I get is simple. They have fixed costs. America has to eat and America has to find a place to sleep. And housing is a, a disaster. Rent increases for a lot of people. Are, I, I understand in the West, particularly, rents are coming down. But the combination of housing and food leads to an American public buried from 2019. Can we establish a policy to assuage that pain? You know, I, I think there are two separate things here. So when we think about housing, um, you know, the main issue with housing is always going to be why aren't we building enough housing uh, prices go up for housing when there's more people who want housing than there are houses out there um you know it, i i sort of laugh because i i literally got an email from a neighbor uh in the last couple days uh telling me about a horrible policy uh that the city wants to pass in ann arbor michigan that would increase density for the horrors, increased density. Um, and, you know, the reality is we need to increase density. If we're not increasing density, we're not going to bring down it's prices because issue. the yep. only way to bring down prices is to build more supply, and that involves having higher density. So I think housing is one of these things where, honestly, progressives uh, get themselves really worked up about it, and then progressives also push policies that reduce uh that reduce housing supply. So right. we've got to face the, the music on that one. I think it's very, very different from grocery price inflation. I think grocery price inflation, it is really, the price, the grocery prices aren't going to come down, but they are going to stabilize and they already have stabilized. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I think that that's, we're just gonna have to adjust. So, um, Professor, can you talk to us about the labor market here? We've seen some really strong labor uh, data recently. I mean, the, the labor market has been so resilient here. Can you give us your thoughts on kind of how you view the U.S. labor market, particularly as it relates to immigration and how that may be impacting the numbers? Because labor is obviously something that the Federal Reserve is looking at. Well, you know, that's what I, I was saying earlier, is that what the Fed cares about is we think that the labor market could be inflationary if the companies are trying to hire and there aren't any additional people to hire. So what will they do instead? Well, they'll start competing over each, over employees and that competition will push up wages and that pushing up of wages uh, will you know spur inflation because if you're paying your workers more, ultimately you're gonna charge your customers more. Now, if instead, when you go to hire, there's some new people who enter the labor market, in other words, the labor market's expanding along labor labor supply is expanding along with labor demand then we don't get any inflationary pressure we actually get uh, the opposite it actually reduces inflationary pressure right. how do we get the labor market supply to expand there's only two ways the people who are already here become more likely to work or we bring in new people who are willing to take right. the jobs and what we've seen are both of those things have happened right. but Really, immigration has been important. Okay, Betsy, I got one minute left. I got Michigan out of state at $77,000 a year. We just published Vanderbilt near $100,000 a year. When are we going to get a handle on the madness of college cost? Um, you know, I, I think, again, it's a really complex issue. Uh, the question on college costs are, you know, what are they paying for? What are they getting? Um, and and how are we going to fund it? Um, so, you know, there's tuition, 
and then there's you know all sorts of things that people do on campus right um you know i i think we got to decompose that and then the last thing to note is remember those sticker prices do not reflect what most people actually pay so as long as we have rising inequality we're going to have higher sticker prices so that we can have the okay. people who are paying the most help subsidize the people who can't afford that. But never enough time. Betsy Stevenson, thank you so much. Truly one of America's best thinkers about our fractured political economic uh, policy. Red and green on the screen to VIX 15.35. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, Lisa, thank you very much. Israeli leaders say the plan is set for military operations in the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where more than a million civilians have gathered. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said the Biden administration is strongly urging Israel against the operation. We have made clear to Israel that we think a full-scale military invasion of Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on those civilians and that it would ultimately hurt Israel's security. So Meanwhile, Turkey announced restrictions on exports to Israel. Turkey said it was taking measures against Israel after it opposed planned Turkish aid drops over the Gaza Strip. Japanese Prime Minister Kishida is set for his much-anticipated visit to Washington. It comes amid growing concerns about provocative Chinese military action. Response continues to come in on former President Donald Trump's announcement on abortion. Conservative activists are doubling down on their endorsement of Trump, but the leader of the nonprofit Christian group Concerned Women for America says they still support federal limits on abortion. Trump declared the matter should be left up to the individual states. Trump falsely claimed that both sides of the abortion debate were happy when the Supreme Court overturned Roe. I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted. Vice President Harris fired back. He's proudly responsible that one in three women of reproductive age now live in a state with an abortion ban. President Biden says 21 states have banned or limited access to abortion since Roe was overturned. Millions watched the North American total solar eclipse, an eclipse on the scale of Monday's event, won't happen again in the U.S. until 2045. UConn down Purdue to win its second straight men's yeah. NCAA title, 75-60. And Sunday's women's NCAA championship game had a preliminary big old audience average of 18.7 million. Global news, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News mm -hmm. Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg Tom Paul. I mean, Lisa Mateo gets a love note. So does Sweeney. Sweeney gets all the <laughs> gentle. Because I got this blistering hate mail from one David Shipley down in Washington. Uh -oh. And he said, Tom, you are not covering women's basketball. And I'm, I'm like, right. You've been leading the way on this, Michael Barr. And, uh, and Paul, you've been great. Two, did they do 18 million last night? No. Purdue Canada? I can answer that. No. <laughs> I, they, and Paul, I mean, I don't as know. you know, they, I mean. It was a late start. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it was, that was, was a late start, and they basically took apart Purdue, right? There was, was there. No, no, it was, it? you're exactly right, Tom. And they've won so many of their games really over the last two years in the tournament by double digits. That's how yeah. dominant they've been. And uh, <clears throat> I thought one of the more interesting points of the night was Danny Hurley saying, I'm not going to Kentucky. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's right. He's going to stay okay over there. What's up? Y'all choked up I'm about choked the Choked up about it. Yeah. You know. It was actually a great view yesterday, so a lot of fun. Yeah, but but you know, I think the women's basketball thing is not a small matter. No. Caitlin Clark. It's a, it's, it's going to change everything. From New York, Bloomberg surveillance. Now we'll look at some local headlines making
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And this Bloomberg Business Flash brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Discover the future of trading with their next generation trading platform, IBKR Desktop. Download IBKR Desktop at ibkr.com slash desktop. All right, not much moving in futures as investors wait that CPI report tomorrow for more clues on inflation that could help the Federal Reserve kind of navigate where interest rates are heading. State Street Global Advisors betting that the Fed will cut interest rates by 50 basis points as soon as June. To the bond market, the two-year yield at 4.77%, that's down about a basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.39%, and that's down about two basis points. To commodities, gold rose to a fresh record. We have spot gold higher at 2,350 four an ounce and then oil climbs near a five month high traders focus on the middle east we have brent crude at 90 dollars a barrel nymex crude at 86 dollars a barrel that is your bloomberg business flash tom and paul gold out to a new level again uh today as well where is it paul my eyes are my eyes are fail. yeah the wti it yeah you know. wti crude oil just uh, under 87 dollars yeah. a barrel brent 90 dollars we're on a 2400 watch on gold uh, yeah Man, absolutely for gold yep yeah. Joining us now, FS Investments, Troy Gajewski. We're on Apple CarPlay. Download the Bloomberg Business app on YouTube. It's real simple. Bloomberg Podcast is how you get to us in a live chat there. Uh, Troy Gajewski, what do people do that aren't on board this market? I mean, I, I'm getting more and more a 1977 feeling. A young guy like you doesn't remember that. But the bottom line is there's a second leg to a bull market. We're in it, aren't we? Yeah, and Tom, I often think of you with your triple levered cash position when it's I look at this slowing balance. I know you've you've been killing it for years on triple levered cash, right? But the you know, when you think about one of the biggest challenges for investors now, it's you know, everyone's built up these massive hordes of cash through money markets. You know, money market balances are up over two trillion dollars since the pandemic. Obviously a lot of T bill purchasing and high net worth accounts and even, you know, smaller client accounts and commercial bank deposits up over four trillion. The list goes on and on. And so, you know, the challenge for investors now is really balancing the greed and fear, right? The greed of understanding that you need a higher than cash return and cash returns are gradually going to go down over time. Mm -hmm. But the fear and recognition that, you know, equities are trading at 21 times forward earnings. And there's a very real risk that, you know, the back end of the curve uh, gets hit at least one or two more times uh, before yields settle at a new relative high. Uh, so, you know, in an environment like this, the key strategies to embrace are things that can make, you know, high single digits, maybe low teens, what we call a meaningful improvement in total return while not taking uncomfortable levels of risk. And so that's really where alternatives fit in right now for people's portfolio. So, Troy, what do you think, given where interest rates are, where do you think a portfolio should be in terms of alternatives? I mean, if you think about the 60-40 portfolio of days gone by, how do you think about alternatives given this rate environment, given where we are uh, just with the economic cycle? Yeah, so, so it depends on the client. Obviously, every client uh, has their own individual risk reward, tolerance for risk. But... And our point is you don't have to go crazy. If you have no alternatives now, you know, maybe build up a five or 10% position. Uh, we'd say in the short term, you can either pull half of that capital from cash, assuming you have five to 10% cash, and then maybe half of the capital from either equities or bonds, depending on your risk tolerance. And, you know, the, the way you always frame that for people is as you're stepping out from cash, uh, focus on Northwest Quadrant and Efficient Frontier strategies, uh, strategies like senior secured commercial real estate lending, you know, private credit you, in, to corporate uh, borrowers has slightly higher return with slightly higher risk. If you need a little bit more growth, um, the uh, private equity strategies that have come democratized through evergreen RIC vehicles that give you, you know, even higher return, but of course, more risk to an economic recession. Uh, so, you know, start at 5 to 10. If you're already at 10 to 20, then clearly you want to gradually ramp that up over yeah. time. Um, and, you know, again, if equities were at right. 15 times for earnings and the 10 year was at 6, we'd be having right. a different conversation. Troy, again, we got to go mathy here. We're doing math Tuesday, <laughs> yeah. folks. Come on, Troy. Do you have a real <laughs> handle on the IRR of private equity and, for that matter, private credit? Are you getting mm -hmm. valuation data points? along the way of the recent carnage to give you confidence in the rate of return on private equity and private credit, or are we flying blind to a presumed IRR? Yeah, great question. And, and we're much more compound rate of return focused people uh, than IRR. 
right? Uh, obviously, IRRs, you know, don't necessarily translate to compound rates of return. So, you know, if, if you think about valuation, and, and obviously PA, PE is a broad space, you have mega cap LBO, we're primarily focused on the middle market. And what we've seen, Tom, to your point is, you didn't have this substantial multiple expansion in 20 and 21. Agreed. Uh, Therefore, you didn't have as much multiple uh, compression or repricing in 22 and 23, but we still had multiple compression in 23 that hasn't reflected in NAVs yet so far. And the reason for that, remember, Tom, last year, all the multiple expansion in, in liquid markets really occurred in mega cap tech in the Magnificent Seven. It wasn't until November and December where you started to see uh, some rotation into, into value and cyclicals and, and non mega cap tech. So. We're very optimistic that a year like this, we, we can grow EBITDA, you know, let's call it north of 20%, barring a recession, and, and multiple compressions over for the time being. I can't tell you exactly how much multiple expansion we'll get, but I like our chances. So that's on private equity. I know you like to keep things fast, Tom, so happy to jump into private credit if you'd like. Did you see how he said, who's he's taking over the Exactly. Jump. Paul, jump in here and get 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 young Gajewski under control. Exactly. That, I, I that's right. that's exactly where I was going to go. I mean, boy, we've seen so much cash go to private credit really yeah. since the great financial crisis. How do you view that in a world where you can get, you know, 4.76% on a two-year? Yeah, I think it's just back to that balancing act, right, for investors. The, the, the main use case for private credit um, up until really the last six to nine months where it's been, hey, we got to put cash to work. We have these huge cash cords. But the main use case there was replacing or complementing fixed income where, you know, at, by the end of 21, the, the fixed income was the definition of return free risk, right? You had no return potential, tremendous risk, high degrees of duration, very little income. So, so it worked very, very well, particularly relative to fixed income that you had positive returns while the Barclays ad got smushed. Now that you know base rates have moved substantially and, and leverage in underlying deals have come down, meaning LTVs are more like 40 to 50% today versus 50 to 60 uh, prior to the Q1 of 22, um, you're getting higher return with lower risk. Now, it, it's not that you're making 15%, but you know, high, high single digits without any losses, loss adjusted yields of you know, 10 to 11 percent still looks very, very compelling relative to cash. To, to your point, it's not triple the cash level, but it, but it's roughly double the return you're getting in cash. And of course, you are conceding liquidity. Um, you're subscribing monthly. You have 25 percent or you have the potential to get cash out right. quarterly with a, a gate. Um, so it's not a it's not a free lunch, um, but you're certainly getting materially higher returns. Um, and, and unless we have a very dark economic outcome, you know, default rates should stay relatively benign. Troy, thank you. Troy Gajewski with us, FS Investments here. Yeah. And this valuation of private equity and debt, I think it's uh, tangible. Paul, I got to go back to women's basketball. David Shipley's killing yeah, me this morning exactly. on this. And I love what Hollywood Reporter wrote up here. It was, a pr first of all, it was nowhere until 2021. Okay. You know, nowhere. Yep. But the answer is it's ESPN2. Fox Sports 2, ESPN News. Right. Do you sense that it will just graduate up to the major platforms or will it find a new way? I think it will, Tom. I think it's, it's, we really reset the bar here, I think, uh, women's basketball this year. It's obviously been on a, a very strong trajectory over the last you know four, five, six years, if not even longer. But I think it just feels like it's kind of jumped it to another level here. And again, that $18.7 million, I, I'm sorry, $18.7 million audience for the South Carolina Iowa game, that's the only sporting event uh, in the limited uh, in the United States to draw our bigger TV audience since 2019. Have been football, the World <clears throat> Cup, and the Olympics. I mean, it's right there at the top. And so, if you're ESPN and these other sports networks, absolutely, you're going to put I, that. You're going to feature that a, going a forward. Massive bidding war. I, I just can't imagine. And I think they just five, signed. Seven. I think they just signed a ten-year contract yeah, recently. So it's almost it. like they yeah. kind of missed an opportunity to yeah. reset. I don't know. You wonder if they'll just rip it up and maybe uh, redo it. We're going to rip it up and tell you how to find us our new distribution, Apple CarPlay. Also, Google out at Google Play. Download the Bloomberg Business app on YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Lisa, we have a new photo on uh, the chiclet thingy, the icon. Lisa Mateo. Good. Great, the, you know, yeah. upgrade. great photo upgrade. upgrade. You know, it's great. It's the Lisa Mateo Show on YouTube and look for live chat out on YouTube. This is Bloomberg Surveillance from New York City.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lise Mateo. Futures, little change. This is the buildup to U.S. inflation figures that the Fed will be keeping a close eye on. That comes out tomorrow. As far as a two-year yield is at 4.77%. That's down about a basis point. The 10-year yield at 4.39%, and that's down about two basis points. To currencies, the dollar weaker, Japanese yen, euro, British pound stronger. We have Bitcoin down about a percent at 70, just above 70,000 right now. Companies in the spotlight, Amazon, they're up three-tenths of a but it's flirting with a record and rebound from a post-pandemic route. Shares have actually rallied 22% this year through Monday's close. Then on the flip side, you have Trump Media and Technology Group. Those shares have lost 36% since late March. Their shares this morning are down about half a percent. And news from Microsoft, their shares little change. Nikkei says the company plans to invest nearly $3 billion in Japanese data centers. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. Right now, our Surveillance extroversion correspondent Javier Blas joins us. Yes, on $100 a barrel crude, on $5 a gallon gas here in the United States. But he has made a cottage industry of cocoa and particularly olive oil. We get an olive oil update right now. I'm looking at Oro del Desierto Organic PQL Tin, $89, $95, fresh from Andalusia, Spain. Is the olive oil boom, is it over, Javier? Uh, well, what, what boom are we talking about? Well, price of demand. Demand olive oil from Spain is always going to be booming. It's excellent. I'm a <laughs> bit biased, but it's, it's excellent. Uh, prices, yes, good news for connoisseurs of olive oil that enjoy um, not only the Spanish one, but Portuguese, Italian, and other origins. Uh, prices are starting to come down. It has been raining quite right. over southern Europe. The expectation is that the next crop will be better. So prices are... Uh, wholesale prices are down 20% since the peak in January. We have yet to see these right. translated into retail prices, but it will come. One final question. This Paul's lined up here about Saudi Arabia. <laughs> uh, but Javier, can you tell the difference between Spanish and Italian oh olive boy. oil? Oh, boy. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, well, the, the Spanish is the good one, and the Italian is what you buy when you cannot buy the Spanish one. Oh. That's, that's about it. <laughs> like, well, what's the difference? I mean, seriously, what you're sitting in the kitchen, you know, with Lisa Mateo, you're cooking up, you know, some fish and you got the shallots going and the rest of it. What's the Spanish character that's so different? Is it the flavor? Is it the taste, it's, the viscosity? What is it? It's everything. It's starting from the label where they say it's made in Spain. It's a lot better, <laughs> all of it. That's all you need to know. Made in España. All right, uh, Javier, I'm a you know re reformed Wall Street person. The story that that you had out recently, your column regarding uh, Shell, maybe moving its listing from the city of London to New York. This to me would be a huge blow to the city of London to the London Stock Exchange. What's going on there? It will be absolutely massive. I mean, Shell is the largest company on the blue chip FTSE 100 index. So if the company was to choose to, to leave, it will be quite serious. And I don't think that um, the London market, the stock exchange, and the government really get how serious the threat is. The company already considered in 2021, 2022 to do this. At that point, they decided that probably that was not the time. But now the new CEO, while Tawan new has been already a year on to, into the job, a bit more than, than a year, uh, he is really saying, look, I'm trying to fix the company for the next uh, few months, few quarters. I'm going to focus on uh, cost cutting, on setting uh, units that are not performing well, trying to improve the valuation. But he's saying if after that we have not seen the valuation gap between London stocks, oil stocks, and New York listed oil companies closing, then all options, absolutely all options are on the table, including relocating a uh, shell primary listing out of London and into New York. That will be absolutely a shock for, for the city of London. But I think that while Sawan is a man who means his words, and I think that if by the middle of next year he has not seen that gap closing, he's just going to start asking the tough question. Wow, that would be uh, just really a blow to the London Stock Exchange, of course. Uh, Javier, Brent crude oil, 
$90.49. Is this a demand-driven market or a supply-driven market? Uh, actually, both. We, we have had quite a lot of disappointment uh, data from supply from non-OPEC countries, including uh, a loss of production from the United States during the uh, cold temperatures of, of January, where uh, we, we lost significant amount of production out of the back end in North Dakota and also in Texas and New Mexico in the, in the Permian. But demand is really healthy. Um, I, I know lots of people thinking about peak oil and that, you know, people are going to stop traveling because, you know, we have recovered from the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. All the data that we have seen over the first three months of the year are pointing to very healthy oil demand growth in multiple markets right. from China to Europe to the United States. So it's a combination right. of healthy, I would say, strong oil demand and a bit of restricted supply. And then OPEC, obviously, is keeping a lot of barrels out of this market because right. Saudi Arabia wants to put prices as close to $100 as they can. Well, that's where I wanted to go. Javier, Christian Malik wrote up a year and a half ago, two years ago, how we get to $120 a barrel. And it's off global demand, which you just addressed there. And I'm sorry, we believe U.S. is the marginal player now when we talk about peripheral people. Saudi Arabia, to me, still controls the elasticity of supply. Is that true? It's true in the sense that the Saudis are keeping more than 3 million barrels of their own production out of the market. They can produce 12 and a half million. They are opting to produce only nine. And that is because they want prices to be as high as possible. They believe that the strategy of higher prices and less volume at the end of the day pays for them, uh, that they regain control of the market. Uh, the risk is that they are obviously subsidizing the American shale industry that at current prices, perhaps we are going to begin to see some erosion in oil demand growth in emerging countries. Not, not only oil is, is, is high, the dollar that is uh, the, the currency you price barrels of oil is also very strong. So for places like, uh, you know, India, it's, it's just go getting to the point where, where consumers are going to suffer. But certainly the Saudis control the spigot and it's their choosing that prices are where they are today. Well, why don't our good friends down in Texas and Oklahoma and Pennsylvania, our shale friends, why don't they just pump some more oil out there? We can do it, can't we? Well, uh, for, for, two, for three reasons, I will say. First of all, because their shareholders are saying, actually, don't invest so much money into new production. Can you return uh, me some money dividends? Second, because shale companies go to Washington and they get one message and, and then the opposite from the White House. On the one side, the White House says everything is climate change. We want to restrict fossil fuels. We want to uh, transition to new energies. At yeah. the same time, they say oil is very important. Please, can you produce more because gasoline prices are getting too high? <laughs> and the third one is because everything takes time. Shale industry is not like Saudi Arabia. They can't just right. uh, open the tap and, and have three million barrels of oil, um, you know, at short notice. I mean, companies will right. need to make the decisions today, and there is no guarantee that $100 oil is going to be there uh, six months from now or nine right. months from now when that oil is going to start flowing. Have you, I'm looking here at an olive oil website where they tell you more than you ever wanted to know, <laughs> and they go with Spanish olive oil. They go, in terms of health benefits, Spanish olive oil with its higher polyphenol and biophenol content nice. may provide stronger antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties than the garbage from Italy. Wow. I, I editorialize <laughs> there. Javier, like, are you telling me Spanish olive oil is healthier? I mean, uh, Tom, we are doing this now, not, not on the radio only, but also on YouTube, so you could see me. I mean, you know, my diet is based on Spanish olive oil, and look how happy I look. <laughs> He's got, what do you think, Mateo? What do you think, Lisa? He looks I mean, good. I he's know. Like, his skin just, is glowing. He's just killing he's it. He glowing. goes up, he goes up and he demanded, he went up to Mike in the food court, in the, in the food court, folks, oh, at Queen, Queen Victoria, Victoria Street. Wow. is just outstanding. Javier has a tantrum on the olive oil in the food court in London, and they had to switch it to Spanish olive oil. Only he's such best. a stud. Uh, uh, Javier Blas there, definitive, I can't say enough about his work on hydrocarbons uh, internationally, the acclaim of his book on commodity uh, trading. Javier Blas there, and uh, yes, he will be featured today on our podcast. <laughs> Single best idea. Great to get some good time uh, with Javier Blas. Red is green on the screen. VIX 16 level comes in a better market, 15.34. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul, Lisa, former President Donald Trump, 
is facing backlash from both sides after releasing a new statement on abortion saying the matter should be left up to individual states. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre says millions of women were harmed when Trump supported the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. When it comes to the fundamental freedoms at stake and the devastating health care effects that Republican officials' extreme agenda mean for more and more American women every day, we need to be clear-eyed here. Abortion rights have won in all six states where it has been on the ballot, including in conservative states like Kansas, Kentucky, and Ohio. Some Republicans are now criticizing Trump for not endorsing a nationwide ban, including Trump's former vice president. Mike Pence called Trump's statement a slap in the face to the anti-abortion voters who supported him in 2016 and 2020. It is sentencing day for the Michigan parents held responsible for the deadly 2021 Oxford High School mass shooting carried out by their son. Jennifer and James Crumley were each convicted of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is weighing in on TikTok and that could spark the effort to pass a bill that would effectively ban the video sharing app in the United States. Bloomberg's Amy Morris reports from Washington. Senator McConnell says requiring ByteDance to divest from the video sharing app is squarely within established constitutional precedent. On the Senate floor, McConnell says China's influence has been baked in from the beginning. 170 million Americans are active users of a social media platform that the People's Republic of China treats as a tool of surveillance and of propaganda. McConnell backs a bipartisan effort to pass the bill, forcing the China-based parent company to sell TikTok. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has yet to commit to bringing the bill to the floor. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. And millions watched the North American total solar eclipse. An eclipse on the scale of Monday's event won't happen again in the U.S. until the year 2045. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. Mrs. Keene said, you know, I'm sorry, it wasn't a total eclipse in New York. It was a partial eclipse. Can we go to the next one? And, of course, I said over a beverage. Sure, dear, that's a great idea. (laughs) Ready? Greenland. Greenland. (laughs) You get Iceland, too, in there. I I just had a nightmare. Mitch McConnell on TikTok. I mean, I'm sorry. (laughs) It was scary. Lisa, weigh in here on this. You're dealing with this every day with your kids. If TikTok went away, would our kids be... Denied? Would they would they lose a luster in their life? I don't, there's so many out there. They just go to they just go to Snapchat. Like they switch. You know, <laughs> they just, there's yeah. different avenues for them. I mean, I think the TikTok, the big one for them, are the influencers who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on TikTok. TikTok by going with brand deals and things like Could that. Could you see so. Michael Barr as an influencer on influencer? YouTube? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a certain are demo. A search it's a certain Bloomberg. demo. I'm not yeah. sure how attractive his demo would be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, hey, the truth hurts sometimes. Yeah. But, hey, listen, I, it, I'm, it was, someone said, you know, I think my son said, are you on TikTok? And I'm like, yeah, I wind up the clock. That's yeah. it. And that's <laughs> that's, that's how bad I am. So, Mr. Mnuchin's taking an interest in it. Yeah. And, and I don't know if they can do the code and, you know, the magic of it. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, we'll have much more on that. Look to Balance of Power. Joe Matthew leading our coverage yes. there. Yes. Uh, with Kaylee Lines is is it becomes yep, a Wall massive time. Washington uh, battle. What are we doing? We're waiting for CPI tomorrow. I'm sorry, yep. Paul. It's, it's like bigger than the jobs report. And I guess it'll have something to do with one, three, or eight rate cuts this year. Yeah, exactly. But the uh, answer is, what I'm hearing from everybody listening and watching is inflation's for real. Inflation's for real. And, it, you know, we where, where do we see it? I think a lot of us see it at the grocery store. We see it when we go to the gas station. And I'm looking at, you know, a gallon of gas now is back up to $3.60 a gallon average nationally. You know, it was almost $3 just kind of towards yeah. year end. So that's been a big move there after coming down from, you know, really high levels. Yeah. And then, of course, in the supermarket, I, I can't imagine packaged goods companies cutting prices of basic stuff. Uh, there's something going on in copper up legging up gold up twenty dollars right now twenty three seventy one wow. on gold from new york city on apple carplay on youtube bloomberg surveillance now look at some local headlines making news in-
24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Little movement in futures this morning as investors await CPI data that's due out tomorrow. Uh, right now, we'll head to the bond market. The two-year yield at 4.77%. That's down about one basis point. The 10-year yield at 4.39%, and that's down about two basis points. To commodities, gold rose to a fresh record right now. We have spot gold higher at 2,351 an ounce. Comex gold at 2,369 an ounce. Over to oil, climbing near a five-month high. Trade Traders focused in on the Middle East. Right now we have Brent crude at $90 a barrel. We have NYMEX crude at $86 a barrel. Few companies making news. We have Pfizer. They're up about three tenths of a percent right now. The company's looking to apply for a wider U.S. approval of its RSV shot. And this is after a trial in young adults. It pro pro produced a strong immune response, and that was just as well as in older adults. And then we have BlackBerry. They're up about three percent. The software Blackberry. company announced a robotics collaboration with AMD. And finally, Paramount up three tenths of a percent. The company beat a copyright lawsuit that was brought on by the heirs to the writer of the article that inspired the original Top Gun movie. That is your Bloomberg Business ah. Flash, Tom and Paul. Oh, very good, I appreciate that. Uh, Paul Sweeney, I'm looking here, let's just get this out of the way. Okay. Paramount, oh, I please. mean, is it like day by day, inch by inch, or are you just like not even looking at it? Uh, it's day by day, day inch by inch. Uh, you've got, um, you know, a sky dance there, potentially merging with part or all of Paramount yet to be determined, but it's going along very slowly. You know, usually these things just happen yeah, really quickly. Yeah, exactly, but like what, over lunch. Yeah, what you don't have here is, a, I think, a big credible buyer. Um, you don't have that. And I got so a stock to kind of from 70 to 11. Yep. Yep. Who has the negotiating power here? I mean, I get the romance of the studios and CBS. You know, everybody wants to acquire Margaret Brennan. Well, Sumner I mean. Redstone's daughter, Sherry Redstone, uh, has the, the control here. They have the controlling stock here, so she will make the decision. The question is, how do you treat the other shareholders who aren't Sherry Redstone? Like I, I Mario Belli, for example. Yeah, I saw this. The shareholders are <laughs> yes. not at lunch. Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. Bloomberg Surveillance and our newspaper, the Lisa Mateo Hour, brought to you by IBKR Financial Advisors. Switch to interactive brokers for lowest cost global trading and turnkey custody solutions. No ticket charges, no conflicts of your interests. At IBKR.com slash RIA, we thank IBKR for foundational support of our conversation each and every day. Lisa, you survived the eclipse? I did, but I didn't get to see it. Once I, one, I didn't have the glasses, and two, the clouds rolled in. Right yeah, the clouds rolled in. So right you had all there. the kids yeah. outside looking up, and there was nothing to see. I thought of you there. yesterday because in, in oh. my little area, a bunch of people came out and they did not have glasses. Fortunately, I had extras, oh. so I was the glass the day. bearer here, and I was thinking, who would not get glasses, or who would get the wrong kind of glasses? Who that could was, ever do like that? Someone like Lisa Mateo would do that. <laughs> that would be me. What do you got today? <laughs> well, it has to do with that because. How are people's eyes feeling this morning? You know, so do you have dry mm. eyes from kind of looking too long, or is it something a little bit more severe, like retinal <clears throat> damage? This was actually from the Washington Post. Pretty interesting. Experts are saying if you use the glasses, you're fine, but there were the fakes out there too that you also have to be wary of. But if you have symptoms like soreness, pain, blurriness of vision, if you see gray spots that don't go away, they're saying check with your doctor. And it doesn't happen right away. This can take a few days, a few hours to emerge after kind of looking at the sun for a long time. But the thing to consider is how long your symptoms last. So if you these things persist over after using eye yeah. drops, if you still see blurry, if you still see things like that, definitely call your and, doctor. And this is really helpful. Thank yeah. you for doing this, Lisa Mateo. But the answer is it's not right away. It right? can happen now. It can be two days out, three days out, a week out. No, well. definitely. So it's just, just consider. Yeah, um, this very also good. has to do with the eclipse. So Airbnb bookings, they surge during the eclipse. A lot of people, Airbnb says 25% of its guests in the U.S. with bookings for Sunday night were for a stay in that path of totality. It's a great map in that story. Yeah. It just shows you just coming shows out from exactly Texas all the way through Maine. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's crazy. And <laughs> even top holidays like Memorial Day, you know, Labor Day, Fourth of July weekend. So it was big. So it shows that Americans like this, you know, we experience travel. <laughs> yeah, right. We should have more eclipses more often. 
But they're saying 2024 travel, though, looks a little bit weaker. Um, a lot of it depending on China, you know, what's going on in China. Airbnb, bookings, holding, Expedia, they've all said that they expect things to kind of slow down toward the end of the year. People not traveling as much. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'm traveling. But <laughs> Paul's I, saying I, he's going I, I all just, in. I just paid for economy seats across the pond. I was shocked what it cost. Oh. I, I just, this idea that it's pulled back, I'm like, show me, please. Show me. <laughs> What else do you have? Oh, this one I really like. This was yes. from the New York Times. A Brooklyn sto a school is keeping its doors open for 12 hours. This is going to help parents who are the working families. It's going to help increase enrollment because enrollment has been down. The kids may not be thrilled about it all the time, but a lot of the kids, though, wanted to stay, and they wanted to stay extra. So it's Brooklyn Charter School in bed -Stuy, open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., all completely free. Okay, the sharp decline in students in urban schools, parents working longer hours, right? You have the long waiting list for after school programs. A lot of people can't afford it as well. So it, they're testing it out. So they read books like at 7 a.m., you know, before school starts at 8.30. They go straight through school at 4. And then from 4 to 7 p.m., they get meals, they get served dinner, they do some after extra activities, and they get to sit down and do their homework too. So they're testing okay. it out to see how this works it's, out. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new world. I mean, yep. it's, it's just so different from... And I wonder why enrollments are down, out. just in general. You know. Well, they're saying a lot of people, especially in inner cities, they, they left during the pandemic, yep. and they haven't, haven't come, come back. back. And okay. that they lost nearly 30% of Absolutely. students during the pandemic at that school. A lot yeah. of people, people of means, moved out to Long Island and they haven't come, come back. back. Haven't it's, come just, back. it's just that as simple. And so it sort of goes to that idea of what is it, Paul? Wednesday's the busiest day of the week in yeah. Manhattan now? Yeah, I'm looking at people as we speak Wednesday, coming down Thursday. the uh, curved escalator at the Bloomberg to, HQ. To building out to the big Wednesday. Yes, exactly. I, I think it's nuts. <laughs> hey, don't get me going. I mean, <laughs> they're going to get in trouble. What else, Lisa? What are you? <laughs> and finally, Utah it's become the tech hub power of America's job market. So this is a Wall Street Journal study with Moody's Analytics. Um, the rankings determine the strongest labor market based on five things, okay? Was the unemployment rate, the labor force participation rate, changes to unemployment levels, and also the size of labor force and wages. So here's what they found out. Salt Lake City, the country's yep. hottest job market in 2023. You've been there, Paul. Sure. <laughs> you know about it. It was followed by three cities in Florida, Jacksonville, Orlando, and Tampa. My Miami also made the top 10, um, but they're calling it the Silicon Slopes. That's you know who I think it. was kind of one of the first major companies to move out there was Goldman Sachs about 10 years yep. ago. Okay. A neighbor of mine uh, was the COO there, and he, it was one, his thing to think about where do we go with our big operations thing, and they chose Salt Lake. Where are we and in 10 happy. years? Where are we at for the census yeah. of 2030? I mean, I looked at the list, uh, uh, and it's not just Utah. It's Austin, Texas is up mm -hmm. there and yep. all yeah. the other usual names. Mm -hmm. They're all Southern, they're all Sun, right. they're all away from the ridiculous rental you know, dance that we do here in the tri-state area and frankly other major East Coast cities. Where are we in 10 years? Paul, are yeah. we, where I, are we? I think are the trend, I mean, the trend in our, our entire, my, at least my entire lifetime, it's been the Sun Belt. And, mm -hmm. and we've been pitching the Sun Belt for 30 or 40 years mm -hmm. and, it's, right. and it just got another you know, just a surge here during the pandemic. Why not? So know? we could get a cabana next to, you know, I think McGlone's in Coral Gables, right? I mean, well, he's got like yeah. 6,000 square feet in Coral Gables. Yeah, he's got, he's got the wow. penthouse. You know, he goes down to the breakers <laughs> yep. and he has to. But, <laughs> but the, the, the bottom line is we can move the whole, well, Lisa, can you move to Florida with us? I, I wouldn't mind. I have family there. Let's go. <laughs> you know, let's go. I mean, you know, what do you think? Ken Filio, what do you think? Our global technical director, can you move uh, these kids not. to Florida? <laughs> He's not going Could you anywhere. See him? Yeah, yeah. He's going. Like, well, they're saying the Rich younger generation is is doing that because they have this love for the outdoors too. So, so yeah. you know, we Salt Lake City here. has that. They have yeah. the mountains. Yeah, I was thinking. The great thing about Salt Lake is you, know? you can be at the world class skiing in. 40 minutes. See? None of this crazy I-70 stuff from Denver up to the mountains, which is like a, the death march. This right. easy little right. drive right up to the mountains. The difference is Lisa's in Florida in the Everglades looking for pythons. Yep. <laughs> I'm on the deck of the Betsy Hotel looking right. for a beverage. I mean, exactly. That's a, that's a difference. Lisa Mateo <laughs> there with our newspapers. And today, Red Sox baseball opening wow. day national surveillance Lisa holiday. Weather, I think. Michael Barr putting up with me. There's a countdown clock, six hours, 59 minutes, Two six seconds. Pitch. Big emotional day for the wonderful, way too young Red Tim Sox Wakefield. And they will, I'm sure, for Rachel, they'll do Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline in Boston today. Orioles Boston, opening day.
All right, coming up at the top of the hour. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Apple's still minting more money than God, right? Geopolitics front and center for global Wall Street. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Stocks are coming off another record high. And Michael Barr with news. U.S. Secretary of State discussed the conflict in Gaza. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. The day before an important CPI report, Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney across this eclipsed nation <laughs> and worldwide as well. We say good morning. We're on Apple CarPlay. Thank you for that distribution. The Bloomberg Business app is free on Google Android as well. On YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. It's the best way uh, to get us. And also now on Apple TV, Samsung TV and Fire TV. Wow. Look. To Bloomberg Originals, uh, okay. we welcome all the people watching um, Bloomberg Originals channel uh, as well. If we get one more TV distribution, we have to wear makeup. Yeah, I think that's, so. That's, that's in the, the way it, it's in the, the contract. It Mateo had a tantrum and said, you guys, you just look 
like you know no. what and so she said you got you know we got to get makeup if we get well alex Steele says different. she has to invest in her face and john tucker and i we don't invest in our face we just say this is what it is afterthought has 57 bottles of invest in your face yep the only conversation we've had in the last three weeks that made sense was comparing Sephora to Ultra. Okay. Ulta, I guess okay. it's called. It's, uh, you know, Oliver Chen over at TD Collins? Sure. He's expert on yep. this. I okay. mean, I just yes, call, he is. You're I right. call he up is. Oliver and I say, where should we buy the next six bottles? Sephora of Ulta, and he's got that. Lots going on here, of course, after the eclipse. Thank you uh, for that great coverage. And lots more uh, going on. We've got a little bit of basketball talk as well. But the major focus here is CPI. Uh, and, of course, the rate structure, one of the best in the world, Greg Peters, uh, will join us here in a moment. We're in the Interactive Broker Studios, and with our Bloomberg Business Class Futures Up 8, Lisa Mateo. Good morning. Yeah, futures, that's what we want to get to. NASDAQ futures up about two-tenths of a percent. S&P futures up about a tenth of a percent. Dow futures, they're little change. And this is after the major averages closed mixed in Monday trading. The NASDAQ did lead the gains yesterday. As far as the two-year yield, it's at 4.77%. That's up about two basis points. And the 10-year yield at 4.39%. That's down about three basis points. Some economic news, U.S. small business optimism, it dropped to a more than 11-year low in March. Sales expectations, well, they slumped infl inflationary pressures. That still remains a trouble spot. Tomorrow, we have the Consumer Price Index, also the release of minutes from the Fed's last policy meeting. Uh, that could include some clues as to where interest rates are headed. That's what they're going to be keeping a close eye on. Speaking of which, the Fed's Neil Kashkari said he sees a potential for no cuts at all. And then earlier you had uh, Neil Kashkari. He did say, actually, the labor market, though it's tight, it's no longer, quote, red hot. Companies making news. We start with Tesla. They're down half a percent. Uh, they were down half a percent. Now they're down about a tenth of a percent. They reached a settlement over a crash blamed on autopilot. And this comes after Elon Musk said he will unveil a robo-taxi in August. And speaking of robo-taxis, we'll talk about General Motors Cruise Division. They plan to resume testing of its robo-taxis. Sources say the vehicles will hit the streets with safety drivers in Phoenix, possibly today. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. CPI tomorrow, and of course, all the rate talk. And all of you yep. know, I'm, I'm not big on the parlor game. I just like it bores me. I'm way more interested in what the real economy is doing, what corporate issuance is in that. And that's a good time to talk to a portfolio manager. Gregory Peters is the PGM uh, fixed income award winning and acclaimed for finding the appropriate uh, coupon. Greg Peters, just to begin the dialogue here, are you clipping the coupon or can you actually invest forward for total return? Uh, a little bit of both, Tom, uh, but I think uh, clipping the coupon is the hallmark of fixed income. Um, and um, and honestly, I think that is the path forward. So we're in this really uniquely positive situation where as a fixed income investor, you can you know clip the coupon, as you say, uh, earn your yield, earn your carry uh, and lay in wait. Um, and if you think about uh, U.S. Treasuries, as an example, um, if, in fact, uh, we right. do uh, get a recession, then, you know, you have that uh, optionality of rates being cut and uh, a rally in rates. What will chief financial officers do in terms of issuance of bills, notes and bonds if the Fed shows a resilience here and really doesn't cut as fast as many people are hoping or expecting? Do they, have, do they just stop issuing and wait or do they actually <laughs> keep issuing paper? Well, so the U.S. Treasury has no choice but to continue yeah. to issue, just given the deficit. So that's a fait accompli. Uh, but uh, but corporations might be in a different um, uh, place here. Uh, so the expectation in the investment grade corporate market, uh, for example, after the record first quarter is for that to really turn quite negative, meaning that uh, you'll see a net uh, new issuance being uh, really negative for the balance of this year, which could actually be quite a positive. So, you know, this is a um, squirrely year uh, in many ways, you know, given the election. So lots of issuances front loaded. Um, and so technically, we're potentially set up to be in a very good place. Hey, Greg, you know, in the fixed income space, I could just go out there and a two year treasury and get 4.75%. That seems like not a bad trade. Should I do that or should I go out on the credit curve, credit risk, uh, uh, and take a little bit more risk in credit? Yeah, so I think uh, the answer is a little of both. Um, so uh, 
base rates, as you mentioned, are quite attractive. I think that is the driver of valuation within fixed income. Uh, uh, credit spreads are on the compressed side. They do look uh, pretty tight. But from an active management standpoint, dispersion is really quite wide. Um, and so uh, the ability to add kind of alpha by picking the right securities, by picking the right companies um, is uh, as good as we've seen in quite some time. So uh, so I think there's a, a robust opportunity set, but make no mistake, the elevated base rates um, is the uh, tailwind here. The only green I see on my Bloomberg index browser and in fixed income is U.S. corporate high yield. And the same story can be made, you know, in terms of outperformance in 2023 as well, U.S. high yield. Do I go that far? Well, so I think that's, that's uh, you know, an area that uh, does look a little more fully valued to us. Uh, so while I mentioned the uh, alpha opportunities are quite quite robust, just given the uh, the dispersion, uh, you know, spreads are are uh, are tight. Uh, so um, you know, we have a higher quality bias. All else equal, uh, we see more value in investment grade corporates, for example. Um, um, and a higher quality yeah. of high yield, but a lot of that uh, juice has been squeezed out of that market. Hmm. I, I look, Greg, at where we're heading, and the basic idea here is we're in an equity frenzy of people that have got the tech thing right, or even there's a broadening to the market and up we go. Do you envision a point where bonds, particularly in the Bloomberg Total Return Index, catch up, price up, yield down? I mean three years out, five years out, do bonds have a total return opportunity? I think they do, but in a perverse way, Tom, which is um, in the event of an economic slowdown um, or even uh, an extreme slowdown like a recession, right. um, I think bonds will uh, start to assert uh, uh, themselves. So it's about a balanced portfolio, right? And if you rewind the clock back to 2019, even 2020, when bond managers and investors were staring down the barrel of zero rates and tight spreads, you know, that protective quality just wasn't there. And uh, investors moved out of balance, right? They moved much more into risk assets. And so I think there's a, a much more balanced asset allocation scheme currently. Uh, and I think fixed income uh, finally has a place um, in that asset allocation. I want to take one chart. He's got like a 400 page deck, you know, it's kind of, he walks <laughs> into the room, Greg Peters walks into the room and he's got a deck and everybody's like, oh God, do I have to read this? Greg, let me just cut to figure eight, figure nine, which is opportunities to capture spread compression. Oh, boy. Translate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, since I have so many charts, Tom, I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but I am a big fan of distilling it down to charts and cartoons. So um, uh, words, what's your uh, best chart right lost. now? What's your number one chart right now at PGM? I think real rates. So, so if I had to uh, just to seal it down, I know uh, you're focused on real rates as well, but I think yeah. that shows you the opportunity set and the scope, right? Um, and so, when real rates are as high as they are, uh, you know, history, uh, you know, suggests that uh, fixed income is a very good place to right. be. So, um, I would distill it down to uh, one out of the hundred that yeah. I look at. Hugely valuable, Greg Peters. Thank you so much at PGM before the CPI report tomorrow. The ten-year real yield, yeah, two uh, percent, which you know is, is high. There's no question about that. A lot of people uh, saying that's going to come way down. We'll have to see uh, on that. So there's uh, Greg Peters uh, with PGM. PGM. Green on the screen. It's a post-eclipse lift. Yeah, exactly. You know what? We, we, the acclaim we got for playing Bonnie Tyler yesterday. Oh, yeah. Total eclipse of the heart. And I heard that frequently throughout the day. Yes. But I think we were first. Michael course. Barr was tearing up. Yep. And he just remembered, you know, the meat, meat loaf. I just dried Bonnie. my eyes now. You know, it was just too much. The 70s was a good decade. For Future, it was. <laughs> Future's up nine uh, with a good decade. Joining us now with the news, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul, Lisa, President Biden hosts Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida for a state visit starting today, and both leaders will have an eye on China. More with Bloomberg's Jody Snyder in Washington. There'll be a state dinner tomorrow night, um, and basically they plan to form a council on defense industries and allow shipyard workers in Japan to perform more maintenance work on U.S. Navy ships. Um, trying to shore up this military alliance. This is according to a senior administration official who spoke to Bloomberg. 
Bloomberg's Jody Snyder reports that official is talking about the U.S. and Japan working together to produce Patriot 3 missiles. The weapon system is currently made in Japan, but has come under massive cost overruns. Israeli leaders say the plan is set for military operations in the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where more than a million civilians have gathered. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said the Biden administration is strongly urging Israel against the operation. We have made clear to Israel that we think a full-scale military invasion of Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on those civilians and that it would ultimately hurt Israel's security. Meanwhile, Pope Francis met with the family of hostages at the Vatican still being held by Hamas. Evil. He called them bad guys and evil. And um, he was very clear that the hostages need to come home, I think. You know, we, we can all agree. And Turkey announced restrictions on exports to Israel. The list includes more than 50 items, including construction materials. Turkey said it was taking measures against Israel after it opposed planned Turkish aid drops over the Gaza Strip. Finally, UConn down Purdue to win its second straight men's NCAA title, 75-60. to 60. Global news, 24 hours a day, and whenever you want it, with the Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg Tom Paul Lisa. You know, Barr's people called me up. They said, you're giving too much love to Mateo. Okay, opening day, <laughs> 1984, White Sox-Tigers. The Tigers are on their way mm. to a 35-5 and five start, and Young Morris pitches a no-hitter. That's right, young, <laughs> good old Jack Morris, man. I love that guy. And then he went out. A couple days later, I was there. I was in the third base lineup, about 30 rows, near Stephen King and Peter Lynch and all the muck and wow. rocks. Opening day. You were there? I was there. It was the was. best opening day yeah. I've ever seen. And Jack Morris and Roger Clemens dueled nine yeah. innings each. Yeah. And yeah. when he, when Jack Morris came off the mound, thirty-four thousand people stood up. Wow. It was just, it was just what it's all about. You don't see it anymore. Nine innings they're, each. They're yeah. pitching nine, like nine three innings, innings, innings yeah. and four. Oh, he's got seventy-eight pitches. Take him out. <laughs> I, I miss those days. I, I mean, I, that goes back to Sandy Koufax. Yeah. Did we give Did we give him enough love? Well, yeah, that's plenty. You know, that's plenty. We, we need to have a balanced bar, Mateo. Yeah. Kind of thing. It's opening day in Fenway. Wish I was there. Uh, all of you up in Boston. Orioles, Boston. Uh, it'll be interesting to see futures up fourteen on Apple CarPlay on YouTube. Bloomberg Originals. Good morning. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. 
From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Not much movement in futures this morning. Uh, this investors wait the CPI report tomorrow. We have some more clues on inflation, and that could really help the Federal Reserve navigate where interest rates are headed. State Street Global Advisors actually betting that the Fed will cut interest rates by 50 basis points as soon as June. Right now, we have Nasdaq futures up about three tenths of a percent. S&P futures up two tenths of a percent. Dow futures up about a tenth of a percent. The two-year yield at 4.76 percent. That's down about two basis points, the 10 year yield at 4.38%, and that's down about four basis points. To commodities, we have spot gold higher at 2,355 cents an ounce, and over to Brent crude at $90 a barrel. Want to point out Amazon, they're up three tenths of a percent, but they're flirting with a record and a rebound from its post pandemic route. Shares have actually rallied 22% this year through Monday's close. And then on the flip side, you have Trump Media and Technology Group. Those shares have lost 36% since late March. Their shares are down about half a percent. And news from Microsoft. Nikkei says the company plans to invest nearly $3 billion in Japanese data centers. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. Talk about a throwback. Really important research note here from uh, Ross Mayfield. He's with Baird and has a really different perspective and something dated, Paul, around all the factor mm -hmm. chit chat and all that. We welcome Ross Mayfield right now for an important conversation on you know, like your portfolio or your retirement plan out six months or for that matter, six quarters. Ross Mayfield, the opening sentence, market breadth remains solid as sector rotation continues. How quaint. <laughs> Tell me about the sector rotation going on right now. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it, you're worried about narrow market and tech concentration all of uh, last year and early this year. And then tech starts to falter, but energy, materials, industrials, you know, kind of pick up the baton and the, the headline index never really falters. So a bit of a breather here to start the second quarter, but, um, right. you know, breadth by most metrics is just really strong. Another brilliant sentence. Earnings increasingly important <laughs> to backfill stretch. He could, I he, like that he one. could like do the show. Yes. I mean, earnings increasingly important, Paul, to backfill stretch valuations. That goes to April 12th and JP Morgan starting us off. I think so. So Ross, again, as Tom's alluding to, we've got some kicking into earnings season here. What do you need to see? What do you think the market needs to see from corporate America this earnings season? Yeah, well, you guys are being very kind, but I don't know that me saying earnings are important is all that insightful <laughs> either. Um, I, I would say that I, I think one of one of my hesitations, um, the guidance coming into Q1, you know, the, the estimates were fine. They were actually revised lower, less than usual, but guidance has been pretty soft. And particularly for some of the consumer names um, have seen some big gaps down um, on weaker guidance. You know, we've relied on the consumer to such an incredible extent over the last 18, 24 months to drive the economy. We're starting to see some legs from manufacturing and housing, but I still think you, you can't deny how important the consumer is to the economy. So I'm going to be watching, you know, the banks over the next couple of weeks to, to see about uh, credit card delinquencies. We've seen some data that those are upticking, but I think over the course of earnings, um, it's going to be all about the consumer, even as um, other sectors start to outperform. Can you just tell he's from louisville and not new york yeah it's such a pleasant you know, thing there's like a whole gate yeah but it. he's this guy's conflicted in the biggest way tom listen to this he's got his undergraduate degree from the university of K kentucky so right now he's looking for a basketball coach he's got nothing <laughs> and then he gets his mba from the university of louisville i mean i don't know where you go when louisville plays kentucky here so just give us a sense here ross are you as a uk graduate happy that your mr calipari is no longer part of the program uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a diehard UK fan. The U of L uh, NBA was more about proximity than anything. Um, boy, oh boy, that's a loaded question. How much time do you have? Yeah. I, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> Who's I, the I next guest? Time. Cancel them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a, a mutual parting of ways. It was probably time. I hear. Uh, I hear Danny Hurley might be. Uh, no. Nope. Done coaching this year. Maybe he wants to take. Uh, now nah, he's staying right. He's staying in stores, <laughs> Connecticut. You don't have a shot there. All right, so Ross, what do we do? Like, do I need technology to continue to lead this market? You talked, you started off the discussion saying we've had some improving breadth in the market, some rotation, as Tom highlighted. But that's fine and good. But don't I need the big tech names to continue to be to power this market forward? 
you do uh, over the longer term, six, 12, eight, whatever, however you define that, you do need it to work. It's too big of a, of a sector in the economy, of a sector in the headline indices. So I think what you're watching for is, does this remain a somewhat tidy consolidation, right? There was a lot of momentum, a pause was more than due. Or does it kind of devolve and you start to see breakdowns in some of the big names? You know, the Magnificent Seven have really started to, to bifurcate. Some continue to work, some are taking a pause, some have really broken down. Right. You do need tech leadership, I think, overall to, to drive the headline indices higher. Um, if you're a stock picker, you don't need it, obviously. Right. You can you can fish in, in some of these other sectors and find some cheaper stocks. But if you're looking at the headline index, you do need tech to work or at least not to be breaking down right. um, to take another leg. Russ Mayfield, I was going to give this to Greg Peters and it just events went on. But let me go to you and from bond guy to equity guy. And that is, I think, Zero Hedge. I'll give him credit with their great Bloomberg data talking about the buildup in money market funds well out over six point X trillion dollars. Mm. I mean, the money market move doesn't end. Let's begin with that as a fact. What does that mean for equity investment out two years, three years? You know, I, for a time, I, I thought this was cash on the sidelines, right? Money ready to move into equities. As I increasingly talk to our clients, they are so thrilled to be getting four or five percent on a money market that I don't necessarily know until the Fed starts cutting rates if that money is going anywhere. I don't know that that's necessarily fuel to the bull market fire in equities until the Fed is cutting rates and those money market yields don't look as attractive anymore. Our clients are really, really thrilled to be getting some yield on their cash for the first time in 50 I agree years. with that strongly, Paul. I don't know where the tip point is. I haven't done yeah. the math, but but I'm sorry. You got to get the yield down before people go enough. I yeah. mean, that's all there is to it. Exactly. Hey, Ross, on the fixed income side, how much risk do you guys think your clients should be taking these days? You know, probably not too much on the fixed income side. Um, you know, one, just as a barbell to a bull market in equities, you like to play it a little safer, shorter duration, something higher in quality. But also you've got spreads as, you know, just increasingly tight, even as the Fed is saying higher for longer, even as there's these pressures in the economy. Yeah. Um, it, there just doesn't look like a lot of value there to us yet. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe a little bit down the you know down duration, right. but I wouldn't be taking any big risks in credit. Um, Ross, I, I think it's the safety part of the portfolio. Don't be a stranger, Ross Mayfield. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it with Baird uh, today on the equity uh, markets. First thing I did when I came in this morning, I would never do this like a meme stock or a spac or whatever, but I look did look with a political backstory of yep. DJT. This is the Trump stock that everybody's talking about. To review, eighteen dollars a share balloons up with speculation to 44 and then goes basically 40 to 80 mm -hmm. and it's cratered down had an ugly two days three days rather one two three days ugly and we're at 37.10 this morning and the math is beautiful two standard deviations <laughs> down of this gets you right back to the 28 level of the middle of january yep. of uh, january 22nd rather and we're not there but the chart is really elegant about like where can DJT go if you believe it's going to continue south. Market cap today, Tom, five billion dollars. Even uh, they disclosed recently that in 2023 the company had a loss of 58 million dollars on revenue of four million dollars. So a company with four million dollars of revenue has a five billion dollar yeah. valuation and the market's got to figure People out. People doing some work there on the accounting as yep. well. The, account, the accounts in their defense said they had some going concern issues involved. And, yep. you know, let's make clear, Paul Sweeney and I folks aren't doing buy, hold, sell on this, but, you know, I think it's in the news going from, I got a high of $79.38, and it's basically halved down to 37.20 pre-market. Yeah, so we'll I have mean, to, uh, you know, see, we'll take a look at the financials coming forward, but that's where we are today. That's where we are. We haven't even talked about foreign exchange. You're real noodling to the market. I'm going to call it a churn here before the CPI uh, data tomorrow. It'll be an interesting afternoon. Uh, Carol Masser and, and uh, Tom Sav Tim Savanovich will have that for you uh, in the afternoon as we sort of heat up towards the CPI uh, tomorrow. Futures up 11, Dow Futures up 31, the VIX well under 16, 15.25. From New York City, eclipse free. Bloomberg <laughs> surveillance. Bloomberg Surveillance is brought to you by...
24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. NASDAQ futures lead the gains this morning. They're up about three tenths of a percent. S&P futures up two tenths of a percent. But Dow futures, they are little changed right now. The two-year yield at 4.76 percent. That's down about two basis points. And the 10-year yield at 4.39 percent. And that's down about three basis points. Over to commodities, we have spot gold at 2,347 an ounce. Comex gold at 2,365 an ounce. And oil, Brent crude $90 a barrel, NYMEX crude at $86 a barrel. We have more cash concerns over at Boeing. It was, shares were down about half a percent. Now they're up a tenth of a percent. New data shows that it likely didn't deliver any 777 freighters during the first quarter. And to keep in mind, Boeing and Airbus, they report first quarter aircraft deliveries later this morning. We'll keep an eye on that. Over to Papa John's, they're up three tenths of a percent. Plans to open 50 new restaurants in North America by 2028. And finally, some news from Neutrogena. Bloomberg has learned that it's permanently closed closing offices in Los Angeles. That's resulting in 84 layoffs, a lot of which have been offered relocation, but its parent company Kenview, it's also moving its headquarters from Skillman, New Jersey to, yes, Paul Summit, New Jersey. Shares down nice. nearly 1%. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Oh, you gotta go there. I mean, what is the cult? I mean, I, you know, if you go from Skillman, New Jersey to Dallas, Texas, I get it. To move from Skillman to Summit, is that like a massive cultural leap? No, I don't think so. And actually, Bloomberg's got a huge office in Skillman, New Jersey, um, out in the farmlands. Uh, but no, there's lots of corporate stuff there. Just And I don't know why New Jersey's like the pharmaceutical capital of the world. I don't know why. I know that John Tucker probably has the history, how it evolved over the last couple centuries. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, he does. I mean, you know, it's the Pine, the pine Barrens. Exactly. That's what it is. It's Jersey Barrens. Devil, of course. All of us, all of us nationwide, unlike Paul Sweeney, who grew up with all this, where did we learn the Pine Barrens? John McPhee, yeah. the great nonfiction writer, wrote a book yep. called The Pine Barrens. It was magisterial at the time. That's a few years. That was the last eclipse. That was. That's what we saw uh, that, that far ago. Futures up 11, Dow futures up 27. Uh, and of course, indicators, big indicators tomorrow, big economic indicators tomorrow with CPI. And all of our economic work is brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. I have tried for over three weeks to get this guy on. This is the single best gold analyst on the culture and fabric of gold worldwide, I know. He's with a small bank, the Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Banking <laughs> Corporation. And we are honored to bring Global Wall Street, James Steele. James, the back of the postcard analysis is China. China at the margin is buying up all the gold. Who are they buying it from? Well, good morning, Tom, and, and, th and thank, you, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I think much of the reason is uh, not just uh, China, but abroad, and it's the same reason. It's a default play. In the case of China specifically, uh, the property markets have been very weak. The equity markets have been very weak. And this narrows the universe that investors, you know, big and small, are likely to look for. And, and gold uh, is a great safe haven. Now, we're seeing the same thing abroad, but the equity and property markets haven't fallen abroad. And in the case of uh, Western markets, I think what we've seen is asset managers, right. portfolio managers uh, and the like have recognized that equities are very high. Uh, they have no choice in many cases uh, but to be in the equity markets, but they right. do have a choice about how they hedge uh, that exposure and, and, and they've chosen gold. When, when the Chinese buy gold as a general statement, is it bars of gold? Is it old Krugerrands? Is it <laughs> bracelets? Are they down at Tiffany's in Shanghai buying some gold bauble? What, what do you buy when you buy gold in China? Well, it's a, it's a mix. Um, between uh, uh, China and India, 50% um, of all the jewelry, gold jewelry in the world is bought. And wow. uh, roughly, it's a two-thirds uh, uh, jewelry and one-third uh, bar and coin. So, and the the investors who are looking specifically to, to hedge themselves more from uh, equity market and property market weakness, we, you know, will will favor the bar and coins. So, do we have a, a sense here where 
gold should be? I mean, it just is set all time highs every day. I'm not sure people have a sense of how to value this thing. Well, yes, I would agree. And um, uh, I think that's a universal uh, uh, problem where certainly uh, to look at cost of production uh, won't help you at all uh, because the market is well above uh, the average uh, all in sustained cost of production or any measure that you want to look at um, with maybe except for one or two gold mines in the whole world. Um, uh, what you would uh, the, and some of the traditional barometers also are not working very well. Uh, for example, uh, we were looking for 150, 160 basis points. When I say we, I mean Wall Street in January. That's contracted to below 75 basis points of cuts. That would normally have led you to think that gold would recalibrate lower uh, between January and now. But the opposite has happened. Um, real rates are positive. Uh, that should uh, be providing headwinds. Uh, and the dollar has been reasonably firm. None of those things seem to be making a huge impact. And, and, and what I would add is I think the geopolitical element uh, has been very strong. Uh, we've seen a lot of geopolitically led safe haven buying uh, coming in. And there's, there's academic studies to show that gold hedges well against geopolitical risk as well as it does against financial market risk. So I would say right now we are in, in a bit of a no man's land here where where the traditional issues uh, are not having what uh, 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 would not provide you with the guidance that you would normally think. Now, over time, uh, physical demand outside of China is suffering. Uh, uh, it was down last year in India. Uh, a 10 gram bar in India is now 71,000 rupees, double what it was just a few years ago. Uh, jewelry demand uh, is declining. Most people that bought coins um, uh, have already wanted to buy coins have already done so. And I would suspect that if we get an equities correction, and I'm not saying that we will, that's well outside my, my pay grade, but that itself could uh, bring an end to some of the safe haven uh, portfolio led buying that's coming into gold. Right. So those things. Um, that's a yeah. Chinese you know, central do, bank on the, That's yeah. a Chinese central bank on the line. Putting James an order in. Steel, uh, being sure he understands they're buying this morning. Paul, jump in with a question. Hey, for James, James uh, just looking again. Gold's had a, a great run here, up fourteen percent or so year to date. But silver, up over sixteen oh, percent. Listen to you. I'm looking at my GLCO page on the Bloomberg Terminal, global commodities prices, and I see that silver's up over sixteen percent. What's the driver there? Well, there I think we have a more of, of a fundamental reason. Um, the industrial demand is very good for silver, uh, particularly photovoltaic. Um, now, there has been a catch up with gold for, for, for many, many months. Silver did not rally yep. in the wake of gold. And I think it's been recognized that it's undervalued compared to gold. So vis-a-vis -vis gold, there's also a bit of catch up to do. Um, but he, even here, as we get above $27, uh, you do. There's a lot of silver in the world and there's a lot of it above ground. And we're going to see more recycling. And uh, we see he very heavy recycling, particularly when we get to the $30 mark, as we did back when during the Reddit fi uh, uh, fiasco and the silver ran up to, yeah. to $30. We saw a lot of recycling. And I think we can expect the same thing if, if silver yeah. gets up there again. Okay, James, help me here right now. I mean, Lisa and I were talking this morning, and she's got her eye on the Elsa Peretti Aegean necklace at Tiffany's in silver for $5,400. Nice. To Paul's good question and Lisa's interest in the Elsa Peretti Aegean necklace, is silver, <laughs> is silver investable or emotional like gold? Silver has a much greater industrial component. 55% uh, of silver demand is in industry, goes to industry and manufacturing, whereas it's just six or so percent uh, in gold. And, uh, but it is a smaller market uh, in the sense of um, on, on the financial end of it. And that, so it can be moved very quickly. And typically in bull and bear markets, silver will out, outperform gold both to the up and the downside. But it hasn't done that this time. Gold has led the way. Right. Uh, but um, no, it is it is an investable metal and it is a precious metal. 
but it, it, it right. doesn't have the financial market purview that gold has. James Steele, honored to have yep. you on. James Steele, he'll be on Single Best Idea today. Have to have him on. He's a legend with HSBC uh, there. Hope to see Paul. you again um, uh, uh, anytime. Well, we'll see you. you. Well, James Steele, we'll see you again at Gold 4000 and an ounce. How about <laughs> yeah. that? Paul, focus. The Elsa Peretti silver necklace is 5400 No problem. The same bauble in gold from Mateo is 38000 Worth every That's penny. That's a price differential. Yes. 38000 and 5000 worth every penny. It's an Good investment. To know there. It's an investment. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're investing in Lisa. John Mateo. over at Tiffany <laughs> says, Tom, thank you for bringing it up today on the show. Thanks it's an guy. LVMH company. Yeah. The Arnos, they they yep. fancied it up pretty Yeah, they got that deal done. You know, they, they, got, they got Audrey Hepburn's dress there from... Sure. Up, yep. I don't know. I've never been upstairs, but it's up there, I guess. You get the tour. James Steele, that was really, really interesting. On, on gold there in the Chinese dynamic in the Chinese Central Bank. With our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, Lisa, it is sentencing day for the Michigan parents held responsible for the deadly 2021 Oxford High School mass shooting carried out by their son. Jennifer and James Crumley were each convicted of four counts of involuntary manslaughter earlier this year. Prosecutors are recommending 10 to 15 years, saying both parents have shown a chilling lack of remorse. James Crumley is asking for time served. Jennifer Crumley has asked to serve her sentence on house arrest at her lawyer's guest house. The two are expected to appear in court together today, and the judge will hear impact statements from the families of the four victims. We're learning the FBI arrested an 18-year-old teen in Idaho last weekend who had allegedly been planning violent attacks at local churches. The Department of Justice says Alexander Scott Mercurio had pledged allegiance to ISIS. Former FBI agent Brad Garrett explains that undercover agents will usually wait until the last possible moment to make an arrest. Typically in undercover operations, you let a defendant work all the way up to the moment before he actually wants to launch an attack. And the FBI, apparently through an informant, actually did that. Former FBI agent Brad Garrett spoke to ABC. Marjorie Taylor Greene is ramping up her threat to remove House Speaker Mike Johnson. The New York Times has obtained a five-page letter from the Georgia Republican to her House colleagues accusing Johnson of a, quote, complete and total surrender to Democrats. Greg Vallier is chief U.S. policy strategist at AGF Investments. He says the next move may be what the Speaker does about aid to Ukraine. She's put out the word in the last few days that she would wait and see what happens on the Ukraine legislation. But if Mike Johnson keeps his word and does send a bill to the floor of the House, I think she could erupt. Uh, it's not out of the question that by you know, early May we'd be once again talking about a new Speaker of the House. Greg Vallier of AGF was a guest on Bloomberg Surveillance. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg. Tom Paul Lisa. Michael Barr, thanks so much. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keeney are getting to CPI tomorrow. We haven't really talked about the nuance of it, which is, I guess, it's really sort of boring and a little bit of a tick down in core CPI. I'm, in the, I'm old school enough, Paul, to believe a 3.x on anything isn't good enough for any central bank. Yeah. You can't, if you go up 3% in 10 years, you're up That's 10% all. all in. Yeah. Doesn't work. And right now we're looking at the CPI uh, on a month to month basis. X food and energy up 0.3%. That'd be down from uh, the prior period. And on an annualized basis, Tom, um, as you mentioned, 3.7% yeah. down from 3.8% last period. I'm in the camp zero. I get, I get that Mike McKee looks at 0.3%. Yep. It's meaningless to my audience. <laughs> yes. My audience is looking at a can of black peas at Whole Foods up $1.42 from where they bought it three years ago. <laughs> Bloomberg Surveillance.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures getting a little bit more of a lift as investors await CPI data that's due out tomorrow. Right now, NASDAQ futures up about three tenths of a percent. S&P futures up two tenths of a percent. Dow futures up about a tenth of a percent. The yield on the two year, it's at 4.74. 6%, that's down about three basis points. A 10-year yield, 4.39%, and that's down about three basis points as well. Over to currencies, the dollar weaker. Japanese yen, euro, British pound stronger. We have Bitcoin down about a percent at 70,807. Companies making news. Norfolk Southern down about 2%. It's agreed to pay $600 million in the class action lawsuit. It was settled related to that train derailment in eastern Ohio. And we'll stick with legal woes. We'll go to Paramount. Their shares are little changed, but it beat a copyright lawsuit that was brought on by the heirs to the writer of the article that inspired the original Top Gun movie. And finally, also in the news, BlackBerry, they're up about 4% right now. The software company announced a robotics collaboration with AMD. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. Out on Apple CarPlay, uh, look for us, the Bloomberg Business app. It's free on YouTube right now. Uh, search Bloomberg Podcasts out on YouTube and you'll see the gorgeousity of Lisa Mateo, the handsomeness of Michael Barr. Sweeney shows up, <laughs> studded he is. And then they got some photo of me from like back when I was doing this with David Gura. Joining us right now, it has been far too long, David Gura. Uh, he is really piecing together episode after episode of quality with The Big Take. It is out there on Bloomberg uh, podcasts uh, and uh, we're just thrilled he's like in the building and know. you know he's Rock in the star. food court I mean you know, <laughs> he, he, I he walked into the food court he's looking he's like well since when do we have Cheez-Its yeah you know I mean he likes Cheez-Its he's all granola you know it's like, <laughs> he's like you know he's doing the, the granola thing uh, Janet Yellen's not doing granola she's over with Ambassador Burns in Beijing sipping a beer yes, yes. in IPA. a craft pub <laughs> yeah. because they have American hops is that how desperate we are in our China policy right now? Nick Burns quaffing a beer, and it's not a Narragansett Nick, lager beer. Nick, Boston's favorite son, Nick Burns, living in Beijing, taking Janet Yellen to this brew pub. He got a lager, she an IPA. But uh, <laughs> yes, they stress, Tom, these were American hops in the beer. But Janet Yellen finishing up this her second trip to Beijing as Treasury Secretary. That was the subject of our latest Big Take podcast. And uh, as as Chris Condon, our colleague in Washington, pointed out, what she has been able to do so expertly is carry water for the U.S. government and American companies, relay to them how difficult doing business in China is today, while at the same time really charming uh, Chinese government officials, okay. going on a tour of the Forbidden City, taking a cruise with, with other government leaders. Um, she can unbraid them, and at the same time, uh, they'll listen to well, her. Well, what's Chris Condon say? He's expert on this. I mean, what, the, it's a charm offensive, I get. Charm gets you so far. Whether it's Biden or Trump, after the, in the first Tuesday of November, David, there's an election this November. Yes, you know news that? to Thank me. You. Thank you, Tom. But, but after, date. <laughs> whether it's Biden or Trump, the charm offensive is over. What are we going to tangibly accomplish with Beijing? I pulled Chris Condon out of the brew pub, and we talked a bit about this. And yes, this looms seven months from now. And he said that there were no short-term objectives for this trip other than to keep stable the relationship that Janet Ellen, her colleagues, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, have managed to restore and stabilize. But, of course, it's difficult to keep that in that way with this election looming. She has a very long-term view, but um, it's, it's a huge open question what kind of policies you can put in place, why or how you get Chinese government officials to come to the table and broker in good faith, knowing that if we have a redux of what we had uh, now you know, eight years ago, they, they won't know how much of this is going to stick or how much is going to change. And of course, the tariffs, the, the trade policies that President Trump put in place by and large remain. So mm -hmm. they've, they've learned to live with those, Tom. And David, I think, you know, a lot of investors uh, that Tom and I talk to, uh, they're just not sure what to make of the U.S. policy towards China. The administration, as you mentioned, <laughs> continuing some of the tough uh, policies from President Trump. Yet we see week after week after week, corporate CEO Tim Cook, Elon Musk going over to China trying to say, hey, it's you guys are still really important to us as a customer, as a supply chain. 
it's kind of mixed messages out there. Mixed messages, but you're, you're homing in on something really key, and that is we've seen these overtures, this outreach from the Chinese government toward U.S. Yep. CEO, the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. So just a couple of weeks back, you had President Xi inviting many big CEOs to Beijing for a 90-minute meeting, which is an extraordinarily long meeting. And we had Janet Yellen on this trip, the yep. Treasury Secretary, meeting with U.S. business leaders who are doing business in, in China. So you see in that manifest a bit of desperation to uh, reanimate those conduits, get, get, get American business back in China. Of course, it's been a very difficult number of years because of the trade policies, because of COVID, uh, because of that balloon that was flying over the United States <laughs> exactly. about, about a year ago. But you're right, the confusion persists, and I think it's something that she has been very actively, she, Janet Yellen, trying to, to negotiate and, and, and make better. What's next on the, the Big Take podcast? Joe Doe and Josh Wingrove are working on a piece about U.S. Steel. Of you course, have a staff? Is, well, no. These, um, are, yes. these are colleagues of ours, Wait, Tom, Rich. the greater Bloomberg apparatus. Classy. But there is a staff. <laughs> Helping with the podcast, but but Joe just went out to. Wait, to, wait. How, I'm many, sorry. how many? I'm not going to reveal that. That's a proprietary secret. Do, how yeah. many <laughs> interns do you have, and are they all from Cornell and Chapel Hill? <laughs> right. A very capable staff working on this podcast. Very good. That is all what do you that got coming say. up? Josh Woodgrove, uh, Joe Doe. Joe going out to Pittsburgh to talk about this U.S. steel, the, 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 the Nippon Steel takeover for U.S. steel, uh, and really coming back with some fascinating insights from steel workers, from union members who are grappling with the prospects of a foreign company, Japanese-based company, taking over this iconic, uh, this iconic U.S. company, U.S. Steel, um, thinking about this also in a very long-term way. Yes, it's about their jobs and keeping their jobs in these factories open, but also thinking about their grandkids and if they can have jobs for them uh, in the future in places like Pittsburgh uh, and other cities across America. I mean, 22,000, 23, yeah, 22,000 employees uh, at U.S. Steel, but isn't this, the niece, this deal is kind of, the best economic deal out there for them and you know it doesn't that trump everything i don't want to give too much away about this piece but it, it begins with oh, this please. meeting that Joe, that Joe gets insight into, and that is uh, a Japanese steel executive coming to uh, Pittsburgh to to sort of go through what they would would engineer with this deal, yep. and the, the union really balking at that. But you're you're hitting on something really key, key here, Paul, which is that you know for an industry that has really right. suffered, U.S. steel industry, this was a, a deal that is I won't call it a sweetheart deal, but a deal that preserved a lot of factories, preserved a lot of jobs, and I think that that's what Joe was so interested in. What we get into on the podcast, but we will when it comes out uh, later this week, sort of how they negotiate <laughs> that. Y yes, this pride in having a U.S. steel, an American company, uh, but also a, a sense of sort right. of what they were going to get out of the deal. One of the high points of 2023 Last was year. David Gura fiddle oh. with one Stephanie Rule oh, on MSNBC. I that one. I mean, it's 11 p.m. at night. I can't sleep. Vet bills got me up. How did, this, how did you end up playing fiddle worldwide on the Stephanie Rule Hour? Stephanie uh, invited a guy named Michael Cleveland, who's a Grammy Award-winning bluegrass fiddler, yeah, who is, he's yeah. blind, he's 80% deaf in one ear, really a remarkable young man, onto the show, she'd heard about him and his story. He came on, she said, you gotta come on, you know, talk about business, talk about economics, but we're gonna have Michael Cleveland there. Um, she invited me to sit in for the interview, and then after that, uh, her, well, her producer had said for me to bring my fiddle. I was quite sheepish about that, but I brought it, and he and I played a tune. We played "Soldier's Joy." It was wonderful. After it was a real thrill. Yeah, it sounded and it's, like totally rehearsed. I well, mean, it was really tight. totally unrehearsed, and as you'll appreciate, Tom, to, to play with somebody of that caliber. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I have played the fiddle for a long time, but not professionally, and so to play with somebody like that He's was just a really no. Let me just let me yeah. just go, with David Gurr. Go to YouTube and look at these videos during the lockdown, Tom. He's these up were on the roof. Up on the roof. Yeah. These were, like, these know, were five too. minutes, five minutes of just, just joy during the lockdown. Yeah, thank this you. knucklehead's going up on the roof of <laughs> somewhere in Brooklyn, I think. I'm like, is he I in North Carolina? Is he in Brooklyn? My wife and kids you know, just and and he plays. He's an outstanding fiddle just, player. Just so Please take a look. If you understand, a, a gura is a martini that's a gimlet with yeah, an Thomas onion Christmas. in it. Yes. You don't see the the gura no. off to the <laughs> side there. David, this is great. The big take. The big take. Uh, yep. uh, you're doing this five days a week. Is that I, right? I'm, I'm, I have two great co Sarah Holder and Slay Mosin are doing episodes as well. But it's a two or three times a week. I'm doing it. I hope to join you all more frequently as well. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll talk to our people. I'm, no, I'm, 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 I don't yeah. control that. You know. <laughs> what do I know? What, what I want to talk about here, David, and of course this is with a great heritage, your family, in in, in bluegrass. The Osbournes yes. were like the Bob Dylan of bluegrass. They were the first ones to go electronic. They were the first ones to figure out a college audience. 
And, you know, the original Osbournes back in the 60s, they invented it, the accessibility of bluegrass. Why did the audience, and we still owe a huge debt to groups like the Osbournes for, as you say, popularizing bluegrass beyond a kind of niche southern audience? Yeah. Good morning, University of Tennessee, oh, Knoxville. 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 Good morning. <laughs> Bloomberg Surveillance from New York. Gura forced me to play this. <laughs> Coming up, I'm going to break down this market. Phil Taze, CEO of is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have eaten up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. 
Good morning, everyone. Futures up 14, a day away from a CPI report. We'll get to that in a moment. It's going to be a big deal. Good morning on Apple CarPlay. Good morning on YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Active live chat today. Dave, we survived David Gura. That was, we did. Know, it was very good. We did. He huge. didn't bring his fiddle, though. So didn't bring his fiddle. But huge, huge Next response time. to Rocky Top and the, the Osbournes playing uh, as well. Lots to come up in this hour. Really important interview coming up here in moments here. And, you know, how do you prepare for gloom without being gloomy, I guess, is the basic uh, theme. Is where We're waiting for CPI tomorrow, Paul. What do you see? We are waiting for CPI. I mean, we're going to see uh, a little bit of cooling. If, when you look at the core, Tom, 3.7% versus 3.8% last uh, period still higher than I think the Fed would like to see and I think a lot of consumers like to see. Let's mention it right now. Victoria bills yesterday yes. stopped traffic with a call on Bitcoin above 100,000. Yep. By year end, that by the way. That has not yep. had enough conversation. That is mind-blowing. We're off a little bit today. Bitcoin 70,700, yeah. Tom. So Amazing. put that in your portfolio. Amazing call there. Look for that out on Single Best Idea, my new podcast. It's six minutes long. I mean, you know, it's it's not long enough for Lisa. She likes a 20-minute podcast, but it's it, it's good enough out there um, as well. Again, a CPI extravaganza. Uh, we'll do that tomorrow. Uh, and we'll see uh, from there. Futures up 13. From the Interactive Broker Studios with our Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. And we've got a little bit of a lift to the market. That's ahead of tomorrow's Consumer Price Index. Also tomorrow, the release of minutes from the Fed's last policy meeting. And that could offer up some clues as to where interest rates are headed. Now, formal Federal Reserve policymaker James Bullard says his base case is three interest rate cuts this year. Earlier, the Fed's Neil Kashkari said the labor market, although tight, is no longer, quote, red hot. We have NASDAQ futures up three tenths of a percent, S&P futures up two tenths of a percent, Dow futures up a tenth of a percent. The two year yield at 4.76 percent, that's down about three basis points. The yield on the 10 year 4.39 percent, that's down about three basis points. Companies making news, we'll start with Tesla. They're up about half a percent right now. Baird analysts say it may be headed for another vehicle sales decline this quarter. Tesla also in the news for reaching a settlement over a crash blamed on autopilot. And that comes after Elon Musk said he will unveil a robo taxi in august and speaking of robo taxis sources say general motors cruise division they're going to resume testing its robo taxis with safety drivers in phoenix possibly today general motors up nearly half a percent that is your bloomberg business flash tom and paul just very lisa thanks so much very quickly here ed ludlow's a value add with yep. his comments out on twitter about his new tesla Yes. Like he's going out to get a lot, you know, an overpriced latte, latte in of course. Silicon Valley. Yep. And he's got the thing on autopilot or whatever they call it at Tesla. And it's actually really informative as he says I know. how it missed this person <laughs> exactly. and missed that person. Right. Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg Technology, uh, giving us a Tesla update. I, I can't say the importance of the next seven minutes because Phil Taze has the, the courage to say, does anybody have a collective memory of minus 10%, minus 18%, minus Paul, 32, 35%, or dare I say back to the memory that my parents had uh, in the 1930s. He's not a doom and gloomer, <laughs> but Phil Taze is saying, you know what, we can go down. How can you go down to 18% and not be a doom and gloomer? Yeah, so I think that it, it depends on what phase of the market you're in. So right now we've got all this positive momentum that's still playing out. <laughs> And incumbent election years tend to be extremely favorable. Uh, if you look from 1944 forward, on average, they've, they've, there's never been a loss during an incumbent election since 44. And on average, it's 16% annual. So we still have a ways to go here, potentially. It just means the, the president that's in office, that's running for office, is doing as much as he can right. to juice the economy. Lawrence McDonald, out with a wonderful book, says, look, there's this wall of money. What is it, six point X trillion? Trillion, yeah. In money market funds? Set, set How set. do we go down 18% if there's trillions of dollars of money out there? So what's so fascinating about the markets is that, it, you know, you can look at the last 20 years of when markets went down, and it's you can make rejections all you want, but then something happens that is a surprise. You know, oftentimes you look back and say like, well, we should have known this thing mm -hmm. was coming, like with the financial crisis or the internet bubble burst, but it's often a surprise. So I think what one needs to think about is the fact that we can't predict this thing, right? That markets are gonna go where they're gonna go. You have to embrace the boom and stay in the markets, but you have to build in contingencies in your portfolio. And that's what virtually no one does because everyone just wants to bet on the optimistic scenario. 
What is the Corona bias? I'm assuming it's not, you're not against Mexican beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, uh, and I love Coronas, but the, the Corona bias refers to a thing that has happened long enough ago in the markets that we've lost immunity to. So the, the perfect example that I right. think about is, you know, no, no one plans for, no, no one is ready for a kind of stock market loss like we had in the Great Depression, where down 86% over almost three years, then rallied for five years, but then at the end of that, almost 13 year bear market stocks were down 67%. We didn't go positive until what, 41? Yeah, exactly. Something like that? Right, so, so this is a nuclear bomb on basically every investor that's listening right now's portfolio, every advisor that's listening's portfolio, but we're all just saying, look, it doesn't matter because it happened so long ago. There are many events, including the financial crisis, where if you look at things Hank Paulson said, you know, if they didn't come around just when they did, exactly how they did, we could have been in a depression. Had the coronavirus <laughs> had a little bit right. more fatality level, we could have been in a depression I mean, it, again, right? So we need to plan yeah. for these things. I mean, Paul, keep us going, but I just want to tell you that the corona effect <laughs> is the beer served at Michael Barr's 59th birthday party. Wow, big. Okay. A, few, a few were quaffed. Oh, yeah. Good morning to Sylvius yes. in Harlem, best <laughs> food in America. I heard you guys had quite the spread there. Um, all right, so Phil, how are you, what's the message you're giving your clients these days? Well, so I think, if, especially for investment advisors that are listening to this, to this uh, show, you know, it's your job not to just be a cheerleader for the markets when they're moving higher. It's your job to help investors understand that things happen in the markets that they're not aware of or they're not thinking about. And so you build a portfolio. We like something we call a behavioral portfolio. I have a book coming out next February that addresses and there's a long form view of this, but take half of your stock portfolio. And we talked about this last time I was mm -hmm. on, put it in hedged equities, like hedged equity ETFs, hedged equity funds, take the other half, put it in long only stuff. You can be Magnificent Seven, whatever you want. But what that does then is it, it helps to immunize you uh, potentially against a big market drop because then part of your portfolio could actually be working when the stock market gets blown to pieces. Uh, for the other part, for fixed income, be adaptive. Be able to go short duration, uh, investment grade, or high yield depending on what's happening in the markets. So again, I, I would have thought, a lot of folks would have said a 60-40 portfolio kind of hedges me anyway, but that didn't happen in 2022. Yeah, absolutely. So bonds uh, can add stability to a portfolio, right? They often do, but then there are times when they don't. And so we've found five instances over the last 100 years when bonds either equal stock market losses or add to them. So especially when you're talking about real losses, bonds are uh, and really an unreliable hedge against stocks during the market history. So on the long side, where do we go long here in this market? I mean, again, is it up to the individual and the risk preference, whether they go with Magnificent, whatever, or whether they buy utilities? Well, it's interesting. It's been, it's been super painful to be diversified yep. with developed international, with small cap and mid cap, and you just want to have large cap. Uh, but we think you still should be relatively diversified with it. You know, t conventional portfolios do overweight large cap, so that tends to be working this time where you've got this, right. just a big S&P exposure. You've got plenty of exposure to the formerly Magnificent 7, now the Magnificent 2 or 3. Uh, and, and that should still work well for you. So you're gonna be up you know, decently this year, maybe not 10, but mm -hmm. six or seven, yeah. and that'll keep rallying, and, and you, you stay, I think, in that kind of diversified equity approach for the conventional Why market. have we only pulled back? I mean, we had a massive drawdown. Paul aged last <laughs> week, we were 1.8%. <laughs> Just simply, why is that? Why, why, are we, why are we only pulling back 2%? Well, so I think it is all the stimulus that's coming onto the market. And what you said, you've got all this money in, in money markets. Really, 13, 16 months ago, what was the momentum of the markets? It was go to, to invest in a five, right. five and a quarter percent treasury, right? Mm -hmm. So that's changing, and that money is still coming right. into the markets, right? So I just think we're in an up, 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 mo okay. upward momentum market that's going to continue. With Tay's asset management, Phil Tay's with us here on uh, investing with a little bit of thought towards someday. Uh, you could go down, down, down. We're on Bloomberg Originals on Apple TV, Samsung TV, and Fire TV, as well as YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcasts. With our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, and Lisa. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron is in Washington in a bid to unlock billions of dollars in aid to Ukraine. But first, he made the case in Florida as we hear from Bloomberg's Jody Snyder in the nation's capital. 
the British Foreign Secretary did uh, go to meet with Donald Trump yesterday. The UK is really trying to get um, the Republican presidential candidate and his allies in the U.S. House to support for the military aid for Ukraine. Um, some of them have been blocking it. Uh, this meeting came at the start of a trip where he is then going to go to Congress and expected to meet with Republican lawmakers, including House Speaker Mike Johnson. Bloomberg's Jody Snyder in the nation's capital. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida plan to form a consul on defense industries and allow shipyard workers in Japan to perform more maintenance work on U.S. Navy ships as they look to shore up their military alliance. A senior administration official told Bloomberg defense issues will be at top of the agenda during tomorrow's meeting between the leaders. The meeting is part of the first official visit by a Japanese leader to the White House in nearly a decade. The countries are seeking to intensify cooperation on security in the Indo-Pacific region as China takes on an increasingly assertive stance over disputed waters in the South China Sea. The world experienced its warmest March on record. According to the European Union Climate Change Monitoring Service, it caps a 10-month streak in which every month set a new temperature record. Deputy Director Samantha Burgess says it's not only air temperatures rising, but also ocean temperatures. A warmer ocean holds less nutrients which means that it's more challenging for some species to grow there. You also get oxygen minimum zones, which lead to mass uh, fish mortalities. Copernicus says Samantha Burgess. From April 2023 to March of 2024, the global average temperature was 34.84 degrees above the average in the 1950 pre-industrial period. Global news 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. Michael Barr, thanks so much. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen waiting for CPI tomorrow. Sort of a quiet tape there. I really want to point out dollar resiliency, something nobody's talking about, Paul. Yeah. I, um, I mean, it's just way undersplayed, and I'm sorry, it's a real deal. It is. It's been for such a long time. You just can't make a credible, I think, intermediate, much less longer term, you know, bear case for the U.S. Yeah. dollar, uh, given where rates are. Number one thing I'm looking at, folks, is euro yen. This is not the dollar. This is the euro as compared to Japanese yen. And it's buttressed right up on the resistance to a weaker yen at 165. Paul, for that to break out 166, 167, you know, for the sophisticates out there, that's a <laughs> huge deal to see stronger euro against weaker yen. We're not there yet. No, stronger euro against weaker yen. The, one of the questions is just kind of this euro economy. Uh, has a bottom? Can Germany lead right. it out uh, going forward? Are you doing Bitcoin to a hundred thousand with Alex still here uh, at ten o'clock? Boy, that was a great call she had yesterday. It certainly got my attention, and we're sitting here right at seventy thousand. Uh, yeah. Fixed supply, presumably Resilient. higher demand. Came I don't know. Back. Yeah, Belchuna showed up on time yesterday. Yeah, exactly. exactly. ETF Nirvana. That's too much. <laughs> futures up thirteen. Dow futures up twenty six. We're on YouTube. Thank you for your attention there. Coming up, Paul's going to tell you about it, but. I'm, I'm sorry, it's just simple. We have 30 minutes of brilliant equity analysis coming up from New York City on Bloomberg Originals on YouTube on Apple CarPlay. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lise Mateo. NASDAQ futures, well, leading the charge this morning. They're up nearly half a percent. We have S&P futures up about two-tenths of percent. Dow futures, they are little changed. The yield on the two-year, 4.76 percent. That's down about two basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.39 percent. That's down about three basis points. Over to commodities, we have spot gold higher at 2,352 an ounce. Comex gold at 2,371 an ounce. And oil, Brent crude over at $90 a barrel. Companies making news. Norfolk Southern down 2%. It's agreed to pay $600 million in a class action lawsuit settlement that was related to that train derailment in eastern Ohio. And you have Pfizer. They're up about three tenths of a percent right now. The company looking to apply for wider U.S. approval of its RSV shot. This comes after a trial in young adults. Will it produce strong immune response just as well as in older adults? And finally, a note for all the procrastinators who haven't filed their taxes yet. Yes, the IRS says 70 of its taxpayer assistance centers will be open Saturday. They won't be preparing returns, but they'll be able to help with any last minute they'll questions. Be yes, the deadline Monday. Don't forget that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. Program note I'll get it out on Twitter and LinkedIn. I've been remiss in not doing it. You get high points in the year, like, you know, working with Lisa Mateo. That's sure, a high point. That's a high point. High point for me was wandering up to Boston for a lovely, beautiful weather two days and spending the entire day, and frankly, in the filming, an exhausting day, with Julie Swinehart, mm -hmm. who is the CFO for Fenway Sports Group. And it was so, such a joy, fan or not, to just see what the team at Fenway Sports Group is doing. And I, I really urge baseball. people, if yeah. you haven't seen a Chief Future Show, Seth Magliner uh, spearheading that effort. And it was a year ago, it's dated. But Julie Swinehart, uh, you know, yep. I just said, can you get Mookie back? And you know, <laughs> yes. it didn't work out. But, <laughs> but they're right, having opening day. Right, so. uh, you know, we'll have to, to see what's uh, going on here. Future's up 20, they advance. I, I don't know what to do about a market that's forgotten about a not minus 10%. Yeah. Uh, correction. Yeah, you put up the chart of the S&P 500. You just have not seen that, you know, forget about a 10% drawdown. How about a reasonable 5% drawdown? You know, we talked to Abigail Doolittle, who's the our ace markets uh, reporter here at Bloomberg. And, uh, you know, and she says that that's healthy for a market, uh, but we haven't seen it. We just haven't seen it. We go down to minus 10% and all that. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen here on Apple CarPlay yeah. on YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Really, really thrilled with the the build out there, and now another overlay, Bloomberg Originals on Apple TV, among others. And joining us now for a solid half hour, Linda Deuce will be with us federated yep. in a bit, but right now, Lizanne Saunders on the equity uh, markets. Lizanne, we gotta be quick here uh, uh, this morning, but it's simple. We've been talking about, we just can't correct. Why do we not go down 10% is a normal and healthy market event. Well, let me give you the actual stats, uh, Tom. You've had no more than a 2% drawdown in the S&P year to date at the index level, only 3% for the NASDAQ, but the average member maximum drawdown for the S&P is negative 10%. For the NASDAQ, it's negative 28%. So you've had corrections under the surface. It's just happened via a process of rotation. That's not a bad thing. I think everybody would probably choose that version right. of a correction, whether it's just correcting excesses or correcting concentration, not a bad backdrop. Can this market work higher if tech is not leading? Yeah, in fact, tech hasn't been leading over the past month or so. You've seen energy at the top. Energy's got 100% of its stocks trading about 50-day moving averages. And, and behind that are sectors like materials and uh, and uh, industrials, financials, yeah. even to some degree, and utilities. So, yeah, we're seeing it. Away from your remit, but what does CPI matter tomorrow, Lizanne Saunders? Um, uh, it shouldn't matter just at the flash of the the level, either on headline or core. I think what's important now, given that the Fed's focus is on PCE, core PCE, core services, X housing, is how CPI and in addition PPI kind of maps to what the PCE reading. So I think what will be more important is economists in then figuring out what does that mean for the next PCE print. I think that's what should be focused on. If we have resilient 
it's like an it's like an alphabet soup. C P I P P I P C E. If we have a resilient inflation, Lizanne Saunders, does that suggest higher revenues due to a more buoyant nominal GDP? Well, that's certainly what we got during the the higher inflation era. Yep. You saw very strong top line growth. You didn't see it in terms of bottom line growth because there was that larger differential that brought real change much lower. But yeah, all else equal, I think it it boosts top line. But the the margin story is is what comes into play as it relates to the bottom line. Uh, Lizanne, we get earnings kicking off in earnest later this week. What do you expect to see? What do you think the market needs to see? Well, expectation is around 5% and then it trends higher. The consensus right now for calendar year 2024 is about 10%. Um, but I, I think it's not just things like the beat rate and the percent by which companies have beat, but what the outlook is um, uh, for the latter part of 2024, because that's embedded in forward PE. And I'm not sure there's a lot of confidence in the out quarters. So it's it's not just the the current season, but the uh, the outlook, not just for our earnings per right. share, but also the profit margin story. You've been doing this a few years. What do you make, <laughs> Lizanne Saunders, of James Diamond's 62-page MD&A? An MD&A, <laughs> when you studied the CFA, was like two pages long, <laughs> and it was written by four people in PR. I, I think it's a jewel, Lizanne. What do you think of the value of a 62-page MD&A? Well, I, I can't I can't actually answer that because I haven't read the 62 pages yet. So I've just seen headlines. He certainly provided a pretty wide range in terms of, of inflation and rates. I think I saw some reference, you know, to two to eight percent. So I, I got to start talking in wide ranges like that <laughs> because it basically, you know, sets up that you're yeah. you're not wrong. You can say and I, exactly. I, I nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> I so it's on my reading list. <laughs> yeah. It's on her reading list, but she's actually dead on about CEOs of Paul yeah. taking a wide view to say this. <laughs> Why don't you get one more? Lizanne, um, how about valuations in this market? We've had that big move off of the October lows here. Are we yeah. really running up against some valuation parameters? Yeah, I mean, you know, you got 21 on forward PE. It's less if you take some of the mega cap names out. The 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 rub is that valuation is is stretched. It's rich, whatever term you want to use, but it's a terrible market timing tool, just like sentiment. Sentiment's frothy. It's a terrible market timing tool. So um, sentiment can get be frothy, and valuations can be rich, and they can stay there for years, as we all learned in the late 90s. So as a backdrop, I think it's a risk factor, but it doesn't tell you anything about timing. Lizanne Saunders, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly Good to see you. appreciate it. You know, I didn't know what the theme would be today here into CPI, but you know, I think Phil Tays has really set it up with Lizanne there and Linda Dussel coming up. Paul, we have no collective memory. Can you imagine what the fervor would be on a Friday if we were down 8.2%? Sure, yeah. I can't imagine it because it's been so long it's, since that happened. It's been so long since that's happened. We've had, and again, we've had such a crazy last four or five years uh, and for the markets to digest a whole host of issues they didn't think it didn't think it would right. have to host uh, deal with. Uh, so again, what happens if we do see a material pullback in this market? But as Lizanne was just saying, valuation, a sense of frothiness, those things in yeah. and of themselves are not good market predictors. So. And what stays to me to get to the market opening this morning was Greg Peters at PGM. And I said, what's the one thing that matters? And he said, the real yield. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I don't know what you get done in business with a 2% 10-year real yield. What does that do to small business? What does that do to people trying to run businesses off a credit card. I mean, it just doesn't work. Yeah, we see that in some of the, uh, you know, the credit card data you just referenced, Tom, and a lot of uh, delinquencies, uh, delinquencies going higher. And of course, you, I guess you would expect that given where rates are, uh, given that the economy, while still growing, is slowing a little bit. Uh, so if you're kind of on that small see, business side, that's a challenge. Did you just see my surveillance yawn there? I don't know if they can. No, I already, I did know. you capture that on YouTube? <laughs> the nap and is I, coming up, there? don't worry. That was the Connecticut Purdue yawn. Oh yeah. I mean, they disassembled Purdue. They did. Is, is that the right word? Yeah, methodically, like, like they always Dissembled. seem to do. They've won methodically. Uh, yeah, better said. Two yeah. years in uh, the postseason, they just you know just haven't. Do lost. they play like an NBA game? What's a pixie dust here? What's uh, they play dust? really really tough uh, defense, uh, and they get up and down the court. But Bob, you know the the Danny Hurleys of the world, that that Hurley family tree is all about toughness. Yeah. Uh, and toughness in, in defense. I got ten seconds to go here. Is he going to Kentucky? No. Staying in Connecticut would be my guess. Definitive from Paul Sweeney. Hurley at stores. Fishers up 18. Stay with us. CPI tomorrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. In the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo alongside Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney with your opening bell report. Now, investors, they're kind of in this wait and see approach before some key economic data comes out tomorrow with the Consumer Price Index. We'll also get minutes from the Fed's last policy meeting, and that could include some clues as to where interest rates are headed. Formal Federal Reserve policymaker James Bullard said his base case, three interest rate cuts this year. What's the feeling on Wall Street? Let's get to the numbers right now. We have the S&P 500 up about three tenths of a percent, the Dow up about two tenths, and the Nasdaq up about four tenths of a percent. The two-year yield at 4.75 percent, that's down about three basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.38 percent, and that's down about <coughs> three basis points. Over to gold, spot gold higher at 2,353 an ounce, and oil, Brent crude $90 a barrel, NYMEX crude $86 a barrel. At the bell, I want to check in with Tesla too, because because they have been reporting. Baird analysts say it may be headed for another vehicle sales decline this quarter, so we'll keep an eye on that right now. Tesla shares, they're down at just a fraction, about a tenth of a percent. That is your Bloomberg opening bell report, Tom and Paul. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much. Uh, Lisa had it in the newspaper segment earlier about Utah, Salt Lake City being like the city to move to. And the backstory on that is the next four cities were in Florida. Yep. And Linda Dissel is perfect to talk to this about. Out of Federated Hermes and with all of her work at Wharton and Carnegie Mellon, the, the bottom line is she knows because she's just been on the Federated road trip. <laughs> you know, Steve Auth goes to Florida and spends a week there in March yep. or late February. Sure, Linda waits until, you know, it's a little bit warmer out. You know, it's like, <laughs> and she's in Sarasota and just goes, what? I'm sorry, it's booming. Linda, are we, are we colored by living in the craziness of three zip codes in New York City. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is there's a lot of other places in America. I'm sorry, it's an economic boom of productivity. Discuss that. Uh, yes, well, good morning and thanks so much for having me. It's, it's so great to talk to you today. Uh, yeah, I've been all over Florida for the past couple of months traveling and there is a boom going down here, mm. going on down here. Really, I think it's true around the world. It's what I, what I think is a great way of explaining it is it's an inflationary boom. And this has surprised a lot of people because we've been looking at the old playbook, got a lot of money thrown in our direction and we have been spending it. But the productivity that you speak to is something that looks to be very promising over the next 10 years. It's not like a light switch going off, but it's definitely rolling through various companies and all we're worried about at Federated Hermes is, will the earnings be strong enough to keep this market going? And they will be if we don't see margins getting hit and they stubbornly won't get hit near record highs. So Linda, to keep that margin intact, do you need stronger top line revenue growth or is there still more that corporate America can do on just the cost side? Yes, well, uh, on the top line, they've had the benefit uh, in the revenue line of a high inflation rate. And even yep. as the inflation rate was high and even as it came down, companies could continue to push that through to whomever would buy their goods and services. But now as inflation has come down to a level maybe uh, stubbornly higher than what we'd like, still to a much lower level, can they keep pushing through their costs? Now they need to pay more attention to the cost line. And the big one right there is uh, that they could have any control over maybe is the wage line. And that is where we're getting some good news here. And so much so that we're wondering if we could be in a nice equilibrium kind of an inflationary boom place where you get much lower wage increases, but you don't have to fire your employees and they can continue to pay for their they're pretty good lifestyle, right. not just in Florida or New York, but around the whole country. Uh, top down and bottom up at Federated is still about studying the earnings season. Linda Dussel, what do you expect this earnings season? Well, it's, it's really very interesting. Of course, we bite our nails before each earnings season comes. And we're worried not so much about what happened, but what the outlook is from corporate America. And the good news there is CEO confidence seems like it's been moving up. That is good news. You have seen um, so far, you've only got, I know, 20, 
five maybe names in the S&P have, re have returned their numbers for the quarter and they're beating expectations. So in, if we're right about inflationary boom, then the Wall Street analysts are having a hard time getting on track with this. So they keep underestimating what the earnings trajectory will be. So the earnings expectations are that growth will continue to lead the way. Growth, the big cap tech stocks will probably still do well, but maybe we don't have to expect negative year over year <clears throat> earnings growth, which is what is in the expectations now for the XMAG 7. We are more yeah. bullish on that. And we're thinking you could get maybe an 8% earnings growth this quarter that is not priced right. in. Translate what I just heard, Paul. It sounds to me like everybody purposely lowballs it. So once again, we get high single digit outcomes like Linda's just talking about. More and more companies provide guidance. The analysts just you know jump on the back of that and Do there you, you go. Do you trust their guidance? That's Some companies, it, it's company to company. And you know companies build that confidence and lose it uh, okay. over, over time. Um, Linda, so if, if we were to be venturing outside of the uh, handful of names, tech names that have led this market, what sectors would you suggest folks look at? Well, once once you uh, once you really picked over the Mag Seven, then you start picking over the rest of tech. Now you look at large cap cyclicals because the value plays have absolutely not worked. That's been something that's been working more and more here, and we've seen that. Uh, somewhat in the financials. I'd be very interested to see what happens with the bank earnings this at starting at the end of this week. Very, very interested. But you know, beyond that, materials, energy, energy, you know, nothing's easy in our business. Energy has been running recently, even better than the S P. Is that good? Well, as long as the price of oil doesn't go over a hundred dollars, as long as it doesn't foreshadow some terrible geopolitical event. The rest of the world looks like they might have found a bottom and they're turning. And that's good news for big cap cyclicals. After that, and we've all been waiting for the small caps. We are too at Federated Hermes. <laughs> they're, they're extremely inexpensive. And you know what's super inexpensive right now is the staple sector. On a price momentum basis, they're near record low. Nobody cares about your staple stocks. And if right. you're a long-term investor, you got to look over there and say, I wonder if maybe I should put some money in, in something that hadn't been this cheap like ever. Yep. Hey, Linda, big week for inflation data this week, uh, CPI, PPI. How are you viewing that? Uh, well, the, uh, the CPI figure seems like it's, you know, settling in, coming in. You know, we saw that also from the JOLTS number where the, where the, uh, the quit rate has gone steady now for like four or five months straight. So coming in at maybe 4% ish, or maybe a little bit more, four to four and a half percent ish, increases on wages, the price price figures coming down to maybe under 3%, but can it get to the 2.6% on core that the Fed wants this year end? We're thinking it could be stubborn there and slower than that. And maybe not to maybe only gets to maybe you know, uh, 2.9 or something yeah. like that towards the end of this year on CPI. And then what will the Fed yeah. do if it doesn't go to two? Is there a lot of rebalancing going on now? I mean, I get out the calendar, I'm into April. We're going to dash to June 30, and I assume the rebalance crew start to rebalance. Are we going to see a lot of rebalancing? Uh, I don't really, I, you know, that's not necessarily my area. I really don't think there's anything really much going on big time. We definitely don't see volatility out mm -hmm. there in the market. I think that if, that if there is a rebalancing that's going to happen right. in terms of the overall market, maybe comes towards the end of this year when the baton okay. gets handed over to the to the lesser names that are going to have great comps. Yeah, Linda, thank you so much. Linda Dissel uh, with us with Federated Hermes. I really can't say enough about this is what surveillance is about. Lizanne Saunders and Linda Dissel back to back mm -hmm. is the way we roll. Thank you for listening on Apple CarPlay, YouTube, Bloomberg Podcasts, and Bloomberg Originals as well. The Dow up 78 points. With our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, Lisa, thank you very much. President Biden hosts Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida for a state visit starting today. A senior administration official says the two leaders plan to form a council on defense industries, as we hear from Bloomberg's Jody Snyder in Washington. Those defense issues will be atop this agenda. Um, they'll also be talking about some other uh, kinds of issues, but um, they will really be looking, uh, trying to intensify their cooperation on security um, as they take an increase, increasingly assertive stance uh, against um, China in the disputed waters in the South China Sea. 
Bloomberg's Jody Schneider in the nation's capital. The first parents in the U.S. to be held criminally responsible for their child's school shooting are due to be sentenced this morning. James and Jennifer Crumbly were convicted of involuntary manslaughter. They were tried separately after their son pleaded guilty to killing four students and injuring seven other people at his Michigan high school. Prosecutors have asked a judge to sentence them to anywhere from 10 to 15 years in prison for their connection to the 2021 shooting. Prosecutors argue the Crumleys could have prevented the shooting at Oxford High School by heeding warning signs about their son's mental health or properly securing the firearm at home. Norfolk Southern says it will pay $600 million to resolve all class action claims within a 20-mile radius of the derailment that forced the evacuation of half of East Palestine, Ohio. The company says people and businesses can use the money any way they want to address possible adverse impacts from the mess, including health care needs. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg. Tom Paul Lisa. Bloomberg meme. That's the name of the show. <laughs> you know, I'm looking Paul Sweeney yeah. here at you know where we are on DJT, yeah. which is the Trump affair, moving from seventy nine down to thirty six, just breaking down to a thirty five uh, level on a regular daily chart. I got two standard deviations down is pop at 28 right now. We're not there. We're at 36, but opening uh, in search of a bid is how I would collegially put it. Exactly right, Tom. I mean, 36 and change here off about 2.7% today. Um, and as you mentioned, well off that high of nearly 80. Stocks still double so far this year. But again, what I, the market's digesting right here, I think, is for a company that just reported uh, some financial results for their calendar 2023. Yeah. Four million of revenue. That's it. Four million of revenue and a fifty-eight million dollar loss. So again, no profitability, very little revenue. So people are just trying to get a sense of what the value is here. And as you mentioned, kind of a the meme stock kind of moniker right. is attached to this name. Let's go to the need to listen tomorrow, and that is a CPI report. Some of my radars up, Paul Sweeney, because everybody's telling me it's a non-event. And sometimes when people yeah. tell me it's <laughs> a non-event, I'm like, okay. Let's have a surprise. And yep. my surprise anecdotally is like gas. You mentioned it. I mean, Tucker's, he's aged. Yes, just over he the has. last he's number of happy. days. But, you know, when we get to $4 a gallon, that's not $3.30 a gallon. We're not there yet. But no, we're not there yet. But again, uh, $3.60 is the daily national average gasoline price for, that's according to the American Automobile Association, unleaded, which Matt Miller does not put right. in his vehicles. But again, uh, we're going to see some uh, inflation data, you know, and the reason it's important, Tom, because we know that the Federal Reserve is really thinking about this. They're committed to getting inflation down. The rhetoric has generally been fairly dovish in this in the face of what has been really over the last couple of months, some pretty sticky inflation data um, yeah. that, you know, if they if, if they didn't want to cut rates, you could you could understand why. But uh, a lot of folks yeah. are still out there saying uh, expect a rate cut probably in June, maybe a little bit later. But. You know, we'll where's gold? See. Where's gold in a week? Oh, boy. Twenty one dollars. Exactly. I'm on the twenty four hundred watch. Yep. Twenty three seventy three. I don't even know what to do with that number. It's so big. No, I mean, exactly. You know, it's had that huge move. And again, as we what? heard earlier, central bank buying uh, across the board, most notably China I yeah. is what, what from we're James hearing. Steele. Yep, exactly right. I and, mean, Nixon uh, was thirty five dollars an ounce. <laughs> I know it was a few years. ago. It was a few years ago. It was a few years. Can ago. you imagine thirty five dollars? To two three seven three. Yep. Michael yep. Barr has that. He's got. The, oh, he's got. He's, he's got Krugerrands in the. You know, the he bedroom. does in the basement. I also have a crank dresser. on my uh, Pinto. Also, that's how old I am. Yeah. Yep. I had Remember two. the Pintos? Oh, he, I had oh, two. Of, word. Had you a, had two Pintos. I had an orange and I had driving a, a on baby Route eighty with, with all those trucks. I you had sure a did. Oh, and you survived. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Did you get war duty for that? Yeah. <laughs> I was a brave young man. <laughs> <laughs> the Dow up 37 points. The VIX comes in nicely, 15.17, a better tape than two days ago. Tomorrow at 8.30, the CPI report.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day. On Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We have a bit of a lift to the markets after closing mixed yesterday. It also comes ahead of tomorrow's CPI report that could give some insight on the Fed's next steps. Right now, we have the NASDAQ up about half a percent. S&P 500 up two tenths of a percent, but topping 2,500, the Dow a little change right now. The two-year yield at 4.75%, that's down about three basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.38%, and that's down about four basis points. What's moving the markets? We'll start with the cannabis industry. Tilray, they're down 17% right now, cut its full-year guidance, missing third quarter revenue on top of that. Then we have BlackBerry, they're up 10% right now. Yeah, the software company announced a robotics collaboration with AMD. And we're keeping an eye on Boeing. Shares are up right now. Uh, well, they're little change right now. This is ahead of reporting first quarter deliveries. That takes place at 11 a.m. Wall Street time. Then Boeing's rival Airbus, they announced their numbers at 11.45 a.m. Airbus, their ADRs right now, they're down nearly 2%. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. We do equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. We do all sorts of things around economics, finance, investment, and we are committed to international relations. We did a lot of testing on that over 20 years ago, and we're stunned at the response that we got. And the foundational response of that for me, and I'm, I am a member, is the Council on Foreign Relations and their Bible, Foreign Affairs Magazine. It is the price of a fancy martini. Mm -hmm. you, you, you acquire a print subscription, you read it, you read one or two articles in your busy life, and then you throw the book at the mouthy offspring and say, <laughs> shut up and read Nicholas Lardy. Joining us now, Daniel Kurtz Phelan with a new issue of Foreign Affairs uh, Magazine. Daniel, I'm going to say that you've got a China-centric uh, view at Foreign Affairs because you own the high ground on how America extracted ourselves from World War II and the Civil War of, of China with your book, The China Mission, on what George Marshall uh, did. Bring it over to your incredible essay with Nicholas Lardy, truly an expert on China, of the view forward. What does Nicholas Lardy see in his view forward? Well, first of all, thanks, Tom, for having me back and for the uh, hearty endorsement of our uh, very well-priced subscription. Uh, please go to foreignaffairs.com to uh, to get one of those. But let me let me just st step back a bit to to situate the Nicholas Lardy piece that you're talking about mm -hmm. in the broader debate about China right now. You know, there was this expectation, as you know very well, that China would come roaring back. The Chinese economy would come roaring back from its zero COVID over the last uh, uh, year, a little more. And that did not happen. And that has led to this real kind of attempt to understand what is actually going on with the Chinese economy and especially with Chinese decision making about the about the economy. How much does Xi Jinping see? How does he understand it? Does he have the same objectives that his predecessors have? How does he how does he think about the private sector? Right. There's been a lot of optimism, of course, about China's prospects for continued growth. There's a lot of reason for that. Nicholas Lardy, someone who's been deeply studying the Chinese economy for a long time, I think intends in this piece, which is called China is still rising to push back on that pessimism. And some of that's kind of wishful thinking from uh, Americans who would like the problem to to go away more or less. And I think right. what Lardy's try trying to make clear is that we should be prepared to to live with a rising China and a, and a dynamic Chinese economy for some time. Will they use currency as a tool? And I don't mean so much the Nicholas Lardy's wonderful piece, but within your experience, Daniel Kurtz Phelan, is a totalitarian, very structured, different regime, are they going to use currency as a tool to boost the economy? So they're, they've, they've certainly done that in the past, again, as you know. And the, the, the way I would think about this is less, you know, given the nature of the regime there, it's not going to be a purely economic decision. You have a leadership under Xi Jinping that is really concerned with balancing a very kind of totalizing sense of its own security needs and regime security against what we would consider more traditional economic goals. So you have to you have to look at it and say not just what would make sense if you're a economic policymaker. There are a lot of smart technocrats in the Chinese system who would think about this one way, but ultimately it comes down to the worldview and interests of one person and perhaps a very small group of people around him who have a different view of the world and a sense that their priority is really going to be national security. So you've seen 
I think what the most dramatic change we've seen in China is away from this focus on growth, which for a long time was seen to be the key to everything for Chinese leadership, to much more a concern of security and willingness to really sacrifice growth mm -hmm. if it is is necessary in their view for their own security. So that that I think changes the calculation a lot, and that has led to I think a lot of observers from the outside to be kind of perplexed by what is going on in the minds of leadership. Hey, Daniel, I think on, on Global Wall Street, probably the common question here, or the most known question about China is, is it even investable? Is China investable here? How do you think the Chinese government, after years and years and years of attracting lots of uh, Western investment, how do you think they would answer that question? So, so I think you'd get two different answers depending on who exactly you're talking to in the Chinese government. You've had this real kind of charm offensive by senior senior members of uh, of the regime to try to really make the case to Western business people that it's still okay to be in China. You had Xi Jinping himself meeting with a delegation of American CEOs, you know, making making much of that, trying to send the signal that it's okay to be back, that there are, you know, protections for most businesses. But even as they're saying all that, there are this series of steps they've taken and continue to take that really undermine confidence. And some of that is things like, you know, uh, cracking down on auditors and investigators, much, making it much harder in lots of ways just to do business and to be to be sure that your investments and even your employees are going to be safe in China. So I think right. the the you know, messages, the explicit message is really undercut by all the of all of those actions. Right. And, you know, I'm not smart enough to be to be an investor, but um, uh, if I were, I'd be pretty, pretty wary of the assurances right. that I'm getting. I'm not a, smart enough to give you an informed question, so I'm going to give you an open question as well, Daniel Kurtzvalen. How do you approach a study of the future of Mr. Netanyahu? Ooh, well, that, 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 that is a really tough one. I think that you start to you, we're starting to see the uh, forces starting to really line up against against Netanyahu. You saw one of his uh, partners in the uh, war cabinet, Benny Gantz, call for election September. You've seen a, a heightening of pressure by the United States. Um, there's a lot of uh, a question about what exactly he intends in Gaza. He still says that he wants total victory, but you've seen a, a pullback of Israeli troops in Gaza, which suggests there might be growing skepticism that that's possible. And you've seen big, big protests in Israel. So if I were if I were betting, I would probably say that um, the odds are he's going to be out of power at some point soon. But people have made that bet for a long time, you know, going back uh, to the 1990s, you've had American policymakers and diplomats and, and presidents kind of expecting the end of Netanyahu, and he comes back again and again and again. So almost irrespective of what happens on the ground in Gaza and with the hostages and with the, the future right. of Hamas, um, he's he's a survivor. So so there, you know, he will do everything he possibly can uh, in order to stay in power. I, I, I just want to find a question here, and this goes back one issue to the Ramachandra Gura uh, article. I read every word of it on Modi in India. What did you take away from the giant of Indian history as he wrote about the north-south dichotomy in India? Yeah, it was it was a really powerful piece. This is, of course, a moment when India is really uh, kind of riding high. Prime Minister Modi is about to see probably a very sweeping election victory yeah. over the that's unfolding in coming weeks. And and Guha's point is that for all of this projection of strength and India's, you know, high economic growth, sense of confidence on the global stage, all of which is warranted, he sees Modi really changing something fundamental about the nature of India with its, you know, really kind of small L liberal approach to its ethnic divisions and religious divisions, a commitment to democracy. Even as India is looking very, very strong right now, uh, Modi is kind of deepening a lot of those divisions right. in a way that Guha will, will come back to haunt India in the long term. Daniel Kurzweil, thank you so much. With Foreign Affairs Magazine, can't say enough uh, about it. I'll get some information on that out of Twitter uh, and uh, LinkedIn as well. A lot of emotion at Fenway Park today. Opening day for Red Sox <laughs> Nation. Paul doesn't care. John Tucker doesn't care. Lisa doesn't care. I care. A lot of emotion for the death of Tim Wakefield, total class act. He will be honored, I'm sure, on this opening day. I mean, I mean, and the thing is, you play Fenway. I mean, you're Tom Petty. Yep. Foo Fighters come in. It's local. It's like Jay Giles, Aerosmith, and you got to go back to the 1970s. Perfect. The Cars.
Yes, I'm 